Hello, and welcome to the third in the series of lectures, Introduction to Philosophy. Uh, this was entitled P2, Elaborated Ethics. P2, of course, being my idiosyncratic designation for philosophy in the sense that we do it as uh, one limited discipline in the uh, modern academic world. Ethics, what is it? Well, it's one of the three branches of philosophy. It's the second of them. It's the theory of the good. Do we construe ethics broadly or narrowly? It seems to me that there are two common ways and also two narrow ways that people often misconstrue ethics. Often in philosophy, as well as outside philosophy, ethics, tend to be in, tends, ethics tends to be interpreted narrowly as concerning individual choices, especially with respect to rules governing uh, right and wrong. Secondly, in business and education organizations, we hear about ethics as a matter of narrowly conforming to or failing to conform to the organization's rules. But from the point of view of philosophy, ethics is not just about curbing employee theft or evading corporate liability litigation uh, and so forth. Philosophers rather construe ethics more broadly than these ways. Ethics as conceived by the likes of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, extended broadly to consider what the good life might be. And Aristotle gave a famous definition of what that good life is, and that is flourishing, hmm? eudaimonia. The same sort of broad ideas found uh, later among philosophers such as Rousseau, Marx, Mill, Russell, uh, only this time we call it social and political philosophy. And you know, some of these things that we talk about now as the social sciences ultimately came out of philosophy in the 19th century and, and the natural sciences too. In the 19th century, we used to work, we began to use the word scientist. Uh, William Hewell coins this, I think about the 1830s, and it is now in current use, but we used to call these guys natural philosophers even from the days of the early uh, philosophers. Um, likewise, we now use the term economist for what we might in the 18th century have called a moral philosopher. David Hume, for example, Francis Hutchinson. Um, when philosophers think about ethics, they do not tend to think of a list of commandments, whether this, these be uh, new commandments or old commandments. Rather than propounding commandments, philosophers tend to inquire about what the good life might be, how to go about achieving it. They tend to be interested also in general principles uh, along which we might act. And that's very important, particularly for modern ethics. A philosopher, therefore, is most unlikely to say things like, what's the good? To follow orders. Or, thou shalt, thou shalt not. Is ethics then uh, simply moralizing? Hmm? No. Uh, philosophical ethics is not just finger wagging. Hmm? Well, what is it then? Let's consider the following. Modern ethical philosophers formulate the problem as one uh, concerning either consequences or duty. Some people say to act ethically is to consider the consequences that my actions might produce. But is this so? Is anticipating the consequences of our actions the essence of ethical decision making or is it the opposite? Some say to act ethically is to disregard the consequences that an act is going to produce, simply to do the right thing, to do one's duty. Hmm? As General Patton says, do your duty as you see it and um, the consequences. But is duty enough alone, alone enough? Do the right thing. Hmm? Well, consider lying. Okay. Immanuel Kant, one of the major modern moral philosophers, tells us quite clearly, lying is absolutely wrong always and everywhere, and that's true no matter what the consequences. There cannot be a white lie. There cannot be, as Plato puts it, a noble lie, a lie told for the greater good, uh, a lie which is justified because it produces some benefits and avoids some harms. That is our duty, not to lie at any time. So this is Kant. Well, what do you do if you know the story of Anne Frank, you know, her family was hidden uh, in a house in Amsterdam. Uh, the Nazis came looking uh, a number of times. Finally, they did find them, deported them. Uh, she died in the camps. Uh, her father survived, came back and found her diary. That's why we know about Anne Frank. Um, but what do you do if you're hiding Jews in Amsterdam and the Gestapo comes to the door and says, the truth, are you hiding any Jews? 
most people would say, oh, no, 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 I don't have that right. I don't know that at all. What would Kant say? Well, if it were Kant, and if he were consistent with Kantianism, maybe he wouldn't be, but if he were, he'd have to tell the truth. Yeah, well, I got some Jews hiding in my basement. Oh, sure, screw it. We hit with Emmanuel Kant. Lying is wrong. The consequences of not lying about Anne Frank to the Nazis also arguably wrong. So does morality consist in taking actions without regard to their consequences? Would this be morality or just irresponsibility? And are there worse things than immorality? If lying to the Nazis about Anne Frank is immoral, well, maybe we could say just so much the worse for being moral. Can ethics per se be a bad thing? What does Anatole France say? Uh, if it were absolutely necessary to choose, I would rather be guilty of an immoral act than of a cruel one. Cicela Bach has an interesting book, the book. She wrote the book on lying, <laughs> so to say, and, and considers a number of positions. Uh, among them uh, is the proposition, maybe lying is not always immoral under any or all circumstances, or maybe it is both wrong to lie and to betray Anne Frank, and there's no clear moral alternative there. That's another possibility. You know, if you're given a choice between right and wrong, that would be easy. Today, I choose to follow the path of righteousness rather than the path of error. Okay, now you're a man. Uh, but what about the conflict, not of right versus wrong, but the conflict of right versus right? This is the essence of tragedy. Hmm? Not when right is opposed by wrong, but when right is opposed by another right. What's the classic example of this? Think about Sophocles' play Antigone, and then Legend of Antigone. Antigone, if you don't know the story, as a brother Polynices, he rebels against King Creon of Thebes. Uh, Polynices and some of the other rebels are killed in battle, and King Creon declares that they will not be buried. Their bodies will lay outside the city walls to be scavenged. Now, that is always bad, but to a traditional Greek, that's horror of horrors. And Antigone has an absolute religious duty to bury her next to kin, that is her brother. And if he is not, if his body is not buried, then his shade wanders as a hungry ghost throughout eternity, not a good fate. But on the other hand, Antigone has an absolute duty to obey her political ruler, King Creon. So what does she do? Well, she decides to do the human thing. Uh, she buries her brother and then she is executed for that. Antigone is put in a double bind. She's damned if she does and damned if she doesn't. No matter what she does is wrong. Even if what she does is also right simultaneously, it's also wrong. Philosophers talk about ethics. Um, of course, philosophers don't have a monopoly on doing so. There are people who talk about ethics and try to practice ethics outside the bounds of philosophy. But within philosophy, ethics is that branch of philosophy concerned with the theory of the good. There are other theories of good which are not particularly philosophical. And, you know, it's kind of a uh, kind of a bromide that every culture has a set of ethics. Every religious organization has a set of ethics, but are they all equal? Maybe not. Well, here are two women. And the one of the bikini says, everything covered but her eyes, what a cruel male-dominated culture. And the one of the burqa says, Nothing covered but her eyes. What a cruel male-dominated culture. Different cultures interpret differently. Eating people is wrong, is it? Well, we tend to think so. But there are cultures which practice cannibalism. Uh, is eating people wrong? Is it wrong under any circumstances in lifeboat ethics and that sort of thing? So all human cultures have moral ideas. Ideas of right and wrong, virtue and vice, good and bad, or good and evil. Hold that thought. We'll come back to that when we talk about Nietzsche. Uh, bad and evil may not be the same thing. And notoriously, these ideas differ. Anybody who's ever taken a course in anthropology knows this. But is it logically possible that both the swimsuit competition and the burqa are equally demeaning? You know, it's a little known fact. Um, Einstein won the uh, swimsuit competition for the Nobel Prize. Philosophical ethics is not about affirming or articulating the general culture's ideas of right and wrong. It's about finding some general principles by which to make decisions in these sorts of situations. And in addition, there may be some ideas in the general culture that have no particular bearing upon philosophical theories. A good example is altruism. We'll come back to that in a little while. Uh, moral virtue means altruism. Moral vice means egoism to a lot of people. 
in mind. Richard King's a good example. You often find this viewpoint in, in religious ethics. Every man, says King, must decide whether he will walk in the light of creative altruism or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. And we'll come back again to this. But now let's consider the way in which philosophical ethics differs from other interpretations of ethics. And the main difference is this. Philosophical ethics is not so much concerned with this or that particular maxim, this or that particular rule for how to act. It's concerned rather with general principles. There are particular maxims such as thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. There are all these other religious thou shalt, thou shalt not, the 50, uh, 10 uh, commandments. Um, there's a Hippocratic Oath. I will not cut for stone. I will not practice surgery. Um, this is interesting because surgeons swear the Hippocratic Oath today, but not, they, they didn't in ancient, practice surgery in ancient times if they swore that oath. Um, but these are all particular limited maxims. So if you want to be pious, then follow the Ten Commandments. But maybe you don't want to be pious. If you want to be a reputable doctor, then follow the Hippocratic Oath. But maybe you're, not, yeah, you're better for something else. However, philosophical ethics, as opposed to, say, the practical intuitions by which otherwise we might all form ethical decisions, is concerned with categorically giving first principles. Giving imperatives, talking about ought. The word ought is the key word in ethics. It's also a word we use in law. You can think of law as a subspecies of ethics, that is, law is trying to do the right thing, but also enforced up to it, including uh, violence uh, in its enforcement. And we're going to talk about morality more generally without necessarily talking strictly about law. And indeed, it may be the case that law sometimes is in conflict with morality. That's a possibility too. Immanuel Kant um, makes a distinction, a very basic distinction, between what he calls hypothetical imperatives and what he calls categorical imperatives. Now, Hypothetical imperatives are simply if-then statements. If you want um, goal A, then you choose means B as the best way to get there. But it doesn't tell you why you want to choose goal A in the first place. A categorical imperative, though, tells you that a particular goal is imperative uh, no matter what, uh, no matter the circumstances. So a hypothetical is conditional. It involves if-then reasoning. Uh, no clear reason why you want pursue the goal, that's the consequent of the hypothetical, but categorical is not hypothetical at all. Um, so, for example, I could say, if you want to pass this class, then you ought to study. Is that a categorical imperative? No, that's a hypothetical imperative. It's put in the form of an if-then statement. If you want to pass this class, why would you want to pass this class? Maybe you don't. Merely hypothetical imperative being conditional doesn't give us any compelling reason why we ought to fulfill that condition. First principles would include, let's see below, what, what Kant calls the categorical imperative as opposed to the hypothetical imperatives. One, one can see this in Kant's general principle, ought implies can. It is wrong, it is pointless to blame people for things they could not control. Hmm? In 1916, in a Tennessee town, Mary the Elephant went berserk. She killed a person. Turns out she had an abscessed tooth and the elephant handler was not trained in handling elephants and he poked her in her jaw. I think I would stomp somebody under those circumstances. But Mary had to be punished, so she was hanged for her offense of homicide. Um, at a very, very, very distant relative centuries ago. Coming home from the pub one night, he falls into the mill creek, gets caught up in the mill wheel, goes round and round and round and round all night, gets drowned. His mother comes out the next morning and she finds him still going around the mill wheel. Well, the mill wheel had to be punished. The law at the time was called deodand, and if even an inanimate object causes the death of a human being, that object is forfeit to the crown. It was. Poor Miller lost his mill uh, because it had committed homicide. Um, if somebody commits an offense, but they are clearly mad, we say, okay, you get a pass because we have a thing called uh, mens rea and not, and we'll come to that in a minute. Basically, uh, we don't, in our world at least, uh, blame animals, uh, blame inanimate objects, or blame people with diminished uh, mental capacity. Under Kant's basic uh, principle, ought implies can. If you can't 
have done other than as you did cannot have formed an intention to act otherwise how can anybody use the term oh it doesn't make sense but be advised there have been times and places in the world in which this was not absurd think of Hammurabi's code an eye for an eye tooth for a tooth I put somebody's eye out and get my eye put out but, 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 but. yeah you did it the act is what counts not the intention so it's possible to look at things other than as we do, but our, our way is the way that Kant formulates uh, ought implies can. In law, we have the monotonous rules, comes from English common law, but it's also a principle in American law uh, too. Uh, ought implies can, it formalizes this notion. Okay. Consequences or duty. There's a really good uh, exercise that will get us right to the core. Let's jump into it. It's called the trolley problem. Philip a foot. Uh, came up with it. Uh, she was in Oxford for many years and eventually came to UCLA. Uh, Judith Jarvis Thompson elaborated on it a bit too. Here's the, here's the problem. There's a runaway trolley coming down the track. Now, at the end of the track, there are five workmen. And if the trolley keeps on going, it's going to kill those five people. But there is a siding, a spur, on which there is one person working, but only one person. Now, there's a switch that could send the trolley down the siding rather than allow it to continue on its ordinary course down the main track. And there is a person who has their hand in that switch and that person is you. My camera, yeah, you. Two questions. What do you do? And the most important question, why do you do it? And at this point, I usually take a show of hands in class and you know, um, um, we get some people that say pull the switch and some people that don't pull the switch. Okay, why? Well, uh, often the people who want to uh, pull the switch say, well, you know, if I pull the switch, the track, the, sorry, the trolley only kills one person on that track, whereas it would kill five people and, and five deaths are worse than one somehow, so that numbers matter and I'm doing at least a less bad thing, maybe even positively a good thing if I pull that switch. And alas, only one person dies. I'm not happy about that, but at least the five people don't die. Then there are people who sometimes say, no, I don't want to pull that switch, even though those five are going to die. Why not? Well, one of the reasons uh, one might say uh, not to pull the switch is I'm, I would be causing the death of that one person and I wouldn't be responsible. The trolley running down the track going to kill those five people. That's what we might call a surd evil. That is to say it's not caused by any um, intentional agency person or otherwise, or maybe God's involved, but uh, not caused by any intent. And if I do form the intent and, and act accordingly to pull that switch, then I am intentionally killing another person. And that somehow, for whatever reason, that is what's wrong. So diametrically opposed um, actions, and uh, there could be different reasons given for those actions. And of course, that's just a basic trolley problem. There are all, you can bring all kinds of changes. Uh, Judith Jarvis Thompson's uh, twist. Suppose you could push a fat man off a bridge in front of the trolley and stop it instead. Should you do that? We'll come back to that uh, a little later uh, in, in today's lecture. Or, you know, you, the, the problem assumes that, that these are all anonymous people on the track, but what if it's your relatives on the main track and your true love on the siding? Or what if you're Flanders and it's Homer Simpson on the siding, but the family guy is family on the main track. You have a dog in this fight. What do you do? So you, it gets, it can get complicated. But the basic, basic problem is uh, just very simply, do I pull the switch or not? Okay, so I'm not going to pull the switch. I'm not causing any harm. But isn't it the case that not to decide is to decide? Aren't you, in fact, making a choice by choosing not to pull that switch, you are choosing to let the train go on and kill those five people. Isn't that the choice just as much as pulling the, uh, the switch? And again, th this is not a problem that any of us would want to find ourselves in. Nobody is happy about this. You know, there's going to be harm done. There's going to be tears at the end, no matter what happens. But if you're in a tight situation like that, is there a better choice or a worse choice or not? By the way, if you say, I wouldn't pull the switch because I'd feel guilty, okay, that may be psychologically a reason why many people wouldn't. Be advised, well, that's not a philosophical reason to act. You know, avoiding a feeling of guilt is not. Can you give a general principle, a general set of reasons that would guide you not only in this situation, but in other similar situations? That's what philosophy is trying to do instead. And there are two families of doing this in modern philosophy. They're called 
deontic ethics or duty ethics because the word deontic is the from the greek word root word for guess what duty and then there's consequentialist ethics that is ethics which take into account the consequences as opposed to doing a duty without considering the consequences sometimes also called utilitarian ethics because of the association with uh, Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, as we'll see, uh, utilitarian philosophy. But these are the two main options. So let's look at them in order. Kant, of course, you may have guessed, would be the representative of uh, the deontic uh, point of view. For Kant, the good is that which we do from duty. Hmm? The good is to do the right thing, whatever that happens to be, and the consequences will be what they may, the ships will fall as they fall. Kant also says nothing is good in itself. The only good thing is the goodwill. And the goodwill is to will the universal. Fortunately, Kant thinks this, this coincides with autonomy, uh, self-interest if understood in an enlightened way. But I want to will the universal. I'm not going to define that right now, but we'll come back to a definition in a minute. The consequentialist point of view, um, John Stuart Mill, a uh, good, good, good exemplar of that. Uh, Mill starts with the notion that hedonism is a good thing. That is, hedonism is the belief that, that it's a good thing to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. Hmm? Uh, Mill and Jeremy Bentham, who preceded him, talk about what they call the philosophic calculus. That is, before you act, consider the consequences, weigh the costs and benefits, do a cost-benefit analysis, and do what it, whatever action provides the greatest good for the greatest number. The greatest good for the greatest number. Now, Sometimes, unfortunately, this means embracing evil if it is the lesser of two evils. If the only good you can do is the lesser of two evils, then do it. And don't allow the best to become the enemy of the good. Uh, so if you could minimize pain, maximize pleasure, that's good. Even if the alternative isn't necessarily what you would have chosen. So the trolley problem, obviously, um, there, there weren't trolleys in, in the 18th century for Kant or the 19th century for Mill. Uh, so they didn't actually read the trolley problem. It's a 20th century problem. But if you read that to them, I think they would have very clear cut uh, pieces of advice for us and their pieces of advice would be diametrically opposed. Kant, I think, would say, don't pull the switch. Why? Well, because to do so, you're going to set yourself up to decide life and death. Okay. Now, could you will the universal here? This, could you imagine a world in which it was okay for anybody at any time to make a life and death decision about another human being. Well, no, that would be horrible. I wouldn't want to live in such a world. Well, if I wouldn't want to live in such a world, then I shouldn't act in such a way as to create such a world. So therefore, it's wrong to pull that switch and divert that trolley onto the siding with the one person. And it's wrong, by the way, no matter what the consequences, no matter what the numbers. Oops, oh, I keep getting this, I don't know what's going on here. John Stuart Mill, would say, yes, pull the switch. So it's the opposite piece of advice that Kant would give. Why would he say that? Well, if you pull the switch, you're gonna maximize happiness and minimize suffering. Only one person is gonna die as opposed to five. So isn't that a good thing? You're maximizing happiness. So yes, it's right for you to act by pulling the switch. Now, it might make you sad to do it, it probably will. And it may be only the lesser of two evils, but it's still a good act. It's the right thing to do. It is the morally correct thing to pull that switch causing the death of one person because causing the death of the one person simultaneously saves the lives of the five. They're in, in, inextricably intertwined. So Kant and Mill would differ in some key ways, including the prospect that where they faced with the trolley problem, each would give diametrically opposed moral advice. In addition, each of them in their different ways would base their advice on a very general principle uh, which they would insist is absolutely correct, although they're diametrically opposed. Okay. Uh, Kant would say, uh, don't pull the switch because it's absolutely wrong to pull it. Mill would say, pull the switch because it's absolutely right to pull it and absolutely wrong not to pull it. But here's one thing they have in common. When they think about morality, they do so as philosophers, as philosophers when confronted with this or that claim, they're going to ask, yes, but why? In asking the question why, it's tempting, especially for philosophers, to answer the question in universal terms, to frame some maxim, some rule, which would be appropriate for binding upon each and every single person under every set of circumstances, period. Though in their different ways, Kant and Mill both attempt to do exactly this. So notice that 
they differ on a couple of things. They differ on general ideas about what morality is. Kant says deontic, those are consequentials. They differ on specific advice in a situation like the trolley. But they agree on some other things. They agree on absolutism and they agree on universalism. Hmm? Uh, I got a news flash. Fox News is just wrong, wrong, wrong. Um, Kant is a man of the Enlightenment mill is a typical 19th century liberal. Uh, so what Bill O'Reilly tells you that modern secular liberalism just embraces squishy moral relativism at every turn. Just ain't so. Say it ain't so, Bill. Okay, let's look at Kant a little more. Kant gives us an absolute universal principle based in reason. His categorical imperative. But he actually gives uh, three formulations. I'm just going to read through these three right now. I don't like to read slides to you, but let's just take, take a minute to go through them together. Um, and, um, and we'll focus on, uh, on them individually. First formulation. I already mentioned that one. Act only according to that maxim whereby you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law without contradiction. Second formulation. Act in such a way that you treat humanity whether in your own person or the person of any other, hmm? never merely as a means to an end, but always at the same time as an end. When we come to talk about slavery in the very the next to the very last lecture on Hegel, it's going to come up again. Um, Kant has a, has a, this is a peculiar way of putting things. Treat yourself as a person, just as you would treat other people as a person. Huh? Uh, Kant is not an altruist in the sense of saying, you know, what you do for yourself is bad and what you do for other people is good. He says, treat yourself exactly as you would treat other people and treat, treat yourself well. Third formulation of Kant. Therefore, every rational being must so act as though his ma is, if he were through his maxim, sorry, always a legislating member in the universal kingdom of ends. That is, if I act, I am implicitly recommending that the kind of action that I'm doing should be binding on everybody else. Sauce for the goose, sauce for the gander. Hmm? Let's look at um, the first one. Act accor only according to that maxim, whereby you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. Okay. Let's listen to Gordon Gecko's take on this for a minute. Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures. Yes, it's good. Greed is good. Kant says, act only according to that maxim, whereby you can will at the same time it should become a universal law. And uh, Gordon Gecko has a maxim, greed is good. So should we all pursue greed? Can that become a universal law? Well, as Hobbes might interject, um, if we did that, if we universalized Gordon Gecko's maxim, we'd get truly the bellum omnium contra omnis, the war of all against all. Boy, I'm not sure how, if I wanted that tattoo removed, how easy that would be. Hmm. Very, very careful what you put on your skin. So should I wish, Kant might ask, to universalize the bellum omnium contra omnis? Oh, hell to the no, I think would be his reply. The categorical imperative is absolute and it's universal. Again, there are mere hypothetical imperatives. Uh, if you want the best tasting dog food, then choose Alpo. If I want to quench my thirst, then I must drink, but maybe I don't want the best tasting dog food. Maybe I want the cheapest. Categorical imperatives are across the board. A categorical imperative would not be an imperative demanded by this or that particular need or appetite, but demanded of all people universally, categorically, by pure reason, what we all share. Uh, act only according to that maxim whereby you can will that it should become a universal law. Um, incidentally, this has a larger epistemological uh, side as well. Categorical imperatives are comparatively rare. Most of our imperatives are hypothetical imperatives. They're very common. Rarely do humans find choices that are incumbent upon them that they can't just, just cannot get around. Often we find lots of hypothetical choices. If I want A, then I should choose B, but why do I want A? Hmm? Now, you wouldn't know this from a lot of discussions. I hear this all the time. Oh, we make data-driven decisions. We're not just data-informed. The data tells us what to do. And Kant, to make a long story short, I think would see this as a category error. 
Um, there aren't a lot of these things around. Data doesn't tell us. It's, it's something that in other contexts we call in, in, in logic, the naturalistic fallacy. Uh, Kant certainly would not, would not support that. Um, okay, so here's Kant. Let's say I need some cash. I got too much month and too little money. So, hey, I could do a small armed robbery or two, you know, go to hit a 7-Eleven and, and get me through the month. But wait, 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 let me think about this for a minute. Would I want everybody to come in a whole life every time they chose to? No, I wouldn't want that. Could I will a world in which everybody took up armed robbery? No, I wouldn't want to live in such a world. So if that's the case, then it's wrong for everybody to commit an armed robbery. It's wrong for me too, for the same reason it's wrong for anybody else. If armed robbery is wrong, it is absolutely wrong. If it's wrong for me, then it's wrong for everybody. If it's wrong for everybody, then it's wrong for me. And you can imagine that there are certain maxims which, which if universalized would just become absurd. Now, what if the law of the land is that everyone must kill someone who's left? Um, what if the law was always to lie or always to steal? Um, that wouldn't work. So regarding the trolley problem, would I want to live in a world in which one person could just decide to end the life of another on his whim? No, I wouldn't want to, wouldn't want to be in such a world. So then it's wrong for me to pull the switch and it's wrong for everybody, not me included. The categorical imperative is universal. What's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. One size fits all humanity because we share the same inner light, the light of reason. Thus, it's wrong, absolutely, Kant would say, to lie. It's wrong to rob. It's wrong to murder. Now, ho-hum. Um, isn't it convenient? Kant, with all his highfalutin moral principles, ends up with uh, the same uh, acts that pretty much everybody else agrees with. But actually, some critics think this is a strength. Uh, he gives a general rationale for why our ordinary intuitions uh, might indeed uh, be sound. But we can ask, is Kant's absolutism a strength or a weakness? It brooks no exceptions and consequences are morally irrelevant. We saw the example of, of you know, hiding Anne Frank. Do the right things, let the chips fall where they may. Some people see this as a major weakness. Um, all lies are wrong all the time, everywhere, for everybody. Not even white lies can be justified, not even noble lies. But is it always wrong to lie? Okay. Take the example. This comes from a film, The Last Detail. Um, Jack Nicholson goes into a bar there on prisoner escort up to Portsmouth, um, I think from, oh gosh, from Virginia. Um, and um, he's carrying, he's, he's under arms, he's doing escort duty. Uh, and. Uh, needs to check his 45 with the bartender before the bartender will pour him a drink. Okay, so suppose the sailor does this, then he gets drunk, picks a fight, and he says to the bartender, you have my sidearm? Okay, morally, what's the bartender to do? Actually, this is a question that came up before there was, before there were uh, service 45s uh, with, uh, with Socrates in the Republic. Um, Socrates asks the question, if one borrowed a weapon from a friend who subsequently out of his, went out of his mind and asked for it back, surely it would be generally agreed that one ought not to return it and that it would not be right to do so, nor to consent to tell the strict truth to a madman. And his companion, Cephalus, says that is true. Okay. And so, you know, a noble lie, uh, a white lie might indeed be justified. Mr. Plato, is it always wrong to lie? Well, I'm glad you asked me that. Uh, you see, it's a little complicated than mine. Okay. Hmm. Uh, Geneos Sudos, the noble lie. So one response to this dilemma with the sailor in the 45 could be a lie. It's the moral thing to do. What's the reason for that? Because ordinarily people are entitled to the truth, but there are exceptions to the rule. Drunken sailor is not entitled to the truth. Maybe the Gestapo is not entitled to the truth either. Particularly if the consequence is that he's probably going to shoot someone. So Kant would say, on the other hand, no, no, no. This is wrong to lie. Tell the sailor the truth, no matter what the consequences, you owe them the truth. And again, you know, the Anne Frank example comes uh, readily to mind. She gives a little bit. What if one does the right thing, but does it for the wrong reason? Some people have observed that what Kant says in the categorical imperative seems nothing other than a restatement of the golden rule. Treat others the way you want to be treated. That's a very, that's very widespread. Um, the cultural universals are few and far between, but this is a kind of maxim that comes up. General notions of reciprocity in, in lots of different cultures, kind of uh, commonality, if not uh, universal, anthropologically. Um, but this requires some qualification. 
Kant personally was a pious German Lutheran. He behaved in the way someone like that would behave. He cites the golden rule. He wouldn't object to the Ten Commandments, but his rationale for what he says in ethics is secular. It's not specifically religious. Moreover, for Kant, it matters not merely that one does a dutiful act, uh, that one, but that one does it also with right reason, with self-knowledge. For example, it's right to refrain from robbery. Kant would agree. It's right because the categorical imperative tells me so. But suppose instead I refrain from robbery only because the Bible tells me thou shalt not steal. Hmm? That's the same act. But for Kant, the latter is not a moral act because it's not motivated by pure reason. For Kant, morality is not just obedience. Doing the right act for the wrong reason is not moral. So um, the manner in which you achieve your ends is uh, important uh, as well. The superficially right act, but for the wrong reason, doesn't really follow the path of morality. What makes an act moral is not the quality of the act itself, but no, no, no the following of the commandment to, to or for or against. What makes an act moral is the free embrace of what reason tells me is my duty by means of the categorical imperative. And each and every individual is equally responsible to sort that out. Kant happens to think that we will all sort it out in the same way because reason is common to us all. Um, now, what if our potential Robert here has taken a philosophy course and he's read Kant and he thinks back and he says, wait a minute, no, I want to do this robbery because I need the money, but you know, I really can't will this universally. So I really can't do it. The very same, same act of refraining from robbery uh, because I'm afraid of the cops is not a moral act, but if I'm doing it for, for the categorical imperative, I'm doing the, the good act for the right reason as opposed to the good act for the wrong reason. This has um, the following perverse consequence. Um, according to Kant, if a person who was motivated by feelings of empathy toward humanity rendered assistance to a helpless needy person, this act would be of less moral value. It would be the same act performed by someone who loathed humanity, but was motivated purely by a sense of duty. Mm -hmm. So the bank robber who says, well, I'm, uh, I guess I'm not going to do the robbery because I can't will this universal is actually acting morally. And the good Samaritan who just stops out of sympathy to help the guy who's been mugged on the side of the road, not so much. Uh, Schiller uh, wrote a famous parody of Kant. Uh, you know, the, the, the good thing is what you do because it's your duty, even though you may not want to. Gladly I serve my friends, but alas, out of inclination. And although this pains me oft, virtuous I am not. There is no other counsel, but you have to try to despise it and with abhorrence do what that which your duty commands. So if duty tells you to do it, it's a good thing. If inclination tells you, no, something else. This makes Kant seem a bit silly. Um, but in the end, Kant thought that there was uh, a reconciliation between duty and inclination. Uh, at least he argued for that. From Kant's point of view, neither the Golden Rule nor the Ten Commandments can be morally appropriate just because God of the gods said so. Hmm? Do not murder, categorically imperative, not because God said thou shalt not, but because it's the sort of maxim that any rational human being is going to be able to work out for themselves. One size fits all, it's universally binding for that reason. So Kant's view is very much at odds, and this is an important point, with what we call the divine command theory of morality. Now, when we read Plato's dialogue, Meno, this is going to come up. I'm sorry, of uh, This is going to come up. Um, is the good the good because the gods tell us it's good, or do the gods tell us the good is the good insofar as they do because the good is first good and binds the gods as well as, as it binds us? Um, yeah, so Eudifro, we'll get to that. Okay, the categorical imperative again, the three uh, formulations. Act in such a way, the second formulation, that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never merely as a means to an end, but always at the same time as an end. Again, I'll, I'll spend some time with this when we talk about slavery and Hegel, uh, but notice what Kant does not say. Kant does not say never treat other people as means. We do this all the time. We have all kinds of transactional relationships. He says, never treat other people just as means and not as if they had ends in their own right, they were ends in themselves. That's the, the big difference. Okay, Amazon, an extremely successful business model. My secret vice. I used to go, I used to go shopping in bookstores. Um, I have a lot of books in my house. If you come into my house, 
Uh, first thing you see when you walk into the vestibule is uh, bookcases, uh, floor to ceiling, and I have 10 foot ceilings. And every other room in my house has at least one bookshelf. Well, um, gee, you know, instead of driving to borders and parking and spending hours and hours and hours, if I come across reference to a book I want to read, my fingers do to walk and the postman brings it to me probably the next day, often the next day. Wow, I'm hooked. Yeah, but Amazon, hmm, not so savory. Employees in Amazon workplaces are in hell. They're tracked digitally. They have to grab an item every eight seconds. They're micromanaged with respect to their very movements. And if they fall behind four times within 90 days on this eight second uh, window, they're fired. So they speed up. This produces a lot of physical injury. If they become injured, Amazon fires them. They take away the disabilities from Amazon forever. They only have a job for a short period of time. These people are being treated as means to an end for Amazon's profit and not with respect to the ends they may have for themselves. To this person working on delivery, her life is an end in itself. She has wants, she has goals, she has aspirations. Right now she's selling her labor power. This is a means to her own ends. It's also a means to Amazon's ends. To the CEO of Amazon, now that person on the, in the warehouse on the floor is just a fungible employee, just another brick in the wall, just a means to an end today, and there's more where they came from tomorrow. We could discard them without compunction. Um, that's normal business for uh, the man who is set to be, if he's not already the richest man in the world, the first trillionaire. Hmm. To the extent that people are considered just fungible flexibility units, they're being used merely as means and not as ends. Kant would say, this is wrong. One size fits all, does it? Hmm. Is the golden rule even all that golden? Um, here's another take on the golden rule. Do not do unto others as you would be done by because their tastes may not be the same. And if you thought that was Oscar Wilde, a place for this cigar actually Bernard Shaw. Do not do unto others as you would be done by. One size fits all. It sounds attractive. You know, it's simple. It's universal, so it avoids the squishiness of moral relativism. It sounds tough-minded. You know, when people say zero tolerance, you want to take them seriously. And it seems fair. It treats everyone alike. The problem is saying always uh, doesn't itself always work out so well. Hmm? why this is happening. Sorry. Uh, we wouldn't choose clothing based on one size fits all. If you've ever been in the army, you know what this is all about. If it doesn't work for clothing, why should we think it's going to work for ethics generally? Here's a guy. My job keeps me in hell. Therefore, I love my job. Because I'm a Satanist. I love hell. Do unto others, their the tastes may not be the same. Is it really important that all our actions be universal? Here are some other points of view on the importance of finding universal moral rules. Uh, Hugh Auden um, on, on Mark Twain's character, Huck Finn. Huck Finn deciding to steal his friend Jim out of slavery is a pure act of moral improvisation. What, what he decides tells him nothing about what he would do on other occasions or what other people should do on other occasions. And here we come to a very profound difference between European and American culture. Uh, as he takes Kant to be representative European and, uh, and Huck Finn, uh, making ad hoc decisions without you know, general principles to be typically American. Well, is it okay for me to do the right thing? I mean, taking Jim out of slavery, it seems the right thing, um, without laying down the law for every other person. Kant would say no. Uh, Ian Baruma, Westerners believing in one God prize logic. We hate contradiction, but there are many gods in the Orient and the Japanese mind, quote unquote, Japanese mind is infinitely flexible. Morality is a question of the proper behavior at the right time and place. When is it okay to say different strokes for different folks? Uh, is every decision I make a matter of moral obligation rather than individual tastes Do unto others? Their tastes may not be the same. Now, I think Baruma's point can be overdrawn. Infinitely flexible, the Japanese mind, and the Greeks had many gods too. It didn't prevent them from inventing logic and discovering logic in the first place. But I think these guys may be onto something. The preference of European philosophers like Kant, like Mill, 
modern and secular though they might be, might be simply the secular consequence of Western religious history. We look for what makes all souls timelessly equal as they may be before God at the expense of differential duties according to social status, time, or place. Um, Japan doesn't have this same sort of tradition that the Christians, Jews, and the Muslims have. Um, maybe there's a difference there. So the question that these guys are raising, uh, Auden and, and Baruma, is Kant's universalism merely culture bound? Or is it just the secular residue of, of earlier Christian universalism? And if so, does it matter? Um, an idea may have particular temporal origins, uh, cultural origins. Does it discredit the applicability of that idea itself? Logic and critical thinking uh, come from the Greeks. Is it some sort of illegitimate cultural appropriation if Norwegians or Nigerians uh, want to think critically and reason logically? You know, to point to the origin of an idea uh, may not be a logical uh, disproof. Uh, that's, a, that's a common kind of fallacy. Our valuation of universal human rights came to us from the Romans via the Christians. Is it just illegitimate Western imperialism to criticize current Chinese violations of human rights? Uh, the Uyghurs in concentration camps, the way in which the Chinese state harvests organs quite, uh, quite uh, brass, brashly uh, for foreign currency. Um, you know, when, when outsiders say to the Chinese, you, these people have human rights, how dare you Western imperialists lecture us? East is East and West is West and there the twain shall meet. China is sovereign. We have no need to answer to your uh, moral values and don't in, intrude in our national affairs. They, they do this always. I heard this on the radio the other morning. Very, very common response on the part of the Chinese state. Um, and issues of moral and cultural relativism aside, uh, the same problem uh, with universalism, apply, universalism applies to Mill no less than to Kant. Okay. Duty ethics, that's what deontology is. However, concepts of duty will differ. One version of the deontic view is given by Socrates at his trial. And again, we're going to read this. We're going to read uh, Plato's apology. I don't know why this keeps happening. Uh, I know what keeps happening. Well, I'm, I'm okay, I'll, I'll, I'll fix it later. Um, Socrates has a different view of duty than Kant does. He has a surprisingly conventional view. The example he gives is, when, when I was in the war, my commanding officers put me at my station and I stayed there until I was relieved. What's the private fifth general, five private fifth general order? Um, and Socrates thinks of duty as following orders, following the commands of the God. I'm doing what I'm doing, Socrates says, because the God commanded me to do it. These are fairly common ways to think of duty, fairly conventional ways. Socrates in contrast to Kant, has a, fair, has a fairly conventional notion of duty. But Kant has a different one. Um, for Kant, duty is not necessarily the same thing as following orders. It's not whatever daddy, the priest, the drill sergeant tells me to do. True duty for Kant is only what reason dictates as you as a rational being recognizes that duty. Again, he thinks we have the happy consequence that recognition is going to be the same for all because we all have the same rational capacity. He might be right or wrong about that. But in any case, for Kant, duty is compatible uh, with freedom. So if you do your duty, you're also acting freely. You're following your own nature. You're following, so to say, the better angels of your nature. Be, be yourself, but be your best self uh, as a rational being. Again, this is unconventional. So Kant would be the first person to say that when somebody tells me I was just following orders, this is unethical. For any act, even if you're following orders, if it doesn't will the universal, it's wrong. Every act is subject to the same rational test. This is universal for humankind. It doesn't depend on the social order in which one finds oneself. It doesn't uh, depend on the political regime. Um, this was a defense. I was only following orders, which some of the major Nazi war criminals used at Nuremberg. Uh, later on, Adolf Eichmann, when he was tried in Jerusalem, same defense. Uh, people defended Lieutenant Kelly in the Mille massacre the same way. Kant gives us reasons why this kind of defense is just not acceptable. And by the way, Kant, as I suggested, was in other respects a, a fairly conventional, even boring sort of guy. Well, I didn't tell the story about him, but Kant lived in a town called Königsberg. Uh, it's now uh, called Kaliningrad. It was taken over after the Second War by the Soviets turned into a major submarine base. They completely destroyed the old German city 
in which Kant had uh, lived, but he, he, he was born there, lived his entire life there, became a professor at the university there, probably never traveled more than 25 miles from the town in which he was born. And every day, Professor Kant would take a walk in the park precisely at four o'clock. You could set your watch, people did. Oh, Professor Kant started his walk at four o'clock. You know, a boring guy in some ways, but but major figure of the Enlightenment, somebody we still find it important to read today, somebody who in many respects has come into his own in the 20th century. Um, so he was anything but a flaming political radical. He was a moral radical perhaps, but but very conventional in other respects. But for Kant, reason trumps always any political overlordship. In other words, Socrates, the philosopher, doesn't really have a philosophical concept of duty. He has a conventional concept. Kant has a philosophical concept of duty. Okay, so what does Kant say and what does he not say? Let's be precise about this. Kant's deontology is not everybody's deontology. If Kant advises against acting in this or that particular case, it's not because he is against acting as such. He's not against resp taking responsibility into one's own hands. He says, be a legislator for everybody else. He's not against contravening the course of nature. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples that come from student essays on this question that I've, I've given in the past on exams. And I'm not singling these, I won't name the students, I'm not singling them out to embarrass them. On the contrary, these essays come from some of the better students, but even some of the better students can make this kind of mistake. So take note and uh, avoid doing so yourself. Here's an example from a student essay. Kant believes, uh, this person said, that by pulling the trolley switch, one would be putting the fate of the universe in his own hands, thereby violating the universal law that we should do unto others as we want it done to us. Unquote. By deciding to pull the switch, we would disrupt the natural flow of the universe. No, uh, that's not Kant's reason that we would disrupt the natural flow. Here's another one. The deontic approach slash Kant would maximize suffering, but would also not mess with the balance of life and death and not place that decision upon your hands. Significantly, it would not mess with the universe's plan slash destiny. No, Kant never says, don't mess with destiny. Maybe it's arrogant of him, but what he advises is precisely that we all, each and every one of us, do take the law into our own hands and act on behalf of the universe. For Kant, if I'm acting rightly, I'm taking the fate of the universe into my own hands. Acting as a moral agent, I'm required to legislate for all people. Kant simply advises that whenever I establish a one-size-fits-all, that I should do so in the right way, and not the wrong way. It's important to notice also that Kant is not saying don't thwart the course of nature. Now, this is a kind of um, viewpoint that's caught on um, probably from Rousseau uh, initially, um, the Romantic movement and so forth. Nature is the fount of morality and goodness. Uh, products are 100% natural, they're organic, whatever that means, etc. Macrobiotic used to be the word uh, back in hippie days. Um, but nature has some definite uh, downsides. Would we want to say, good old cancer? It's 100% natural. Cancer follows a natural course. I don't think Kant would say, don't do corrective surgery or don't do chemotherapy or don't do radiation because you're going to thwart the natural flow. Kant's point here is that if I thwart the trolley in such a way that I cause the death of that one person who otherwise would not have died except for my action, then I'm acting to decide who lives and dies. And no reasonable person would want a world in which I or anybody else could do that. This is the problem. Not the fact that you or I are exercising your responsibility, not the fact that we're changing the course of nature, not the fact that we might be altering some hypothetical destiny. So let's sum up Kant. The categorical imperative is both absolute and universal. If it binds me, it binds everybody. If it binds everybody, then it binds me. Is this kind of absolutism a strength or a weakness? Is it always wrong to lie no matter what? It's a good question. For Kant, do the right thing, but also do it for the right reason. In any case, morality is not just slavish obedience. He has a universal view, but does one size fit all? Also, Kant talks about duty, but his idea of duty is not everybody's idea of duty. And uh, certainly he is not against our intervening in nature in the course of events. On the contrary, he wants us to do that in the right way rather than other ways. Okay, that brings us to the second guy, Mill, and a very different kind of ethic, the consequentialist utilitarian tradition. Again, Mill is going to give us, like Kant is, an absolute universal principle based in reason, but it's going to be a different principle. 
Here's what Mill says on ethics. Pleasure or happiness is the basis of the good. This is called hedonism from the Greek word hedone, which means pleasure. Pleasure is best when it's universal. The greatest good for the greatest number is what we should seek. And the good act is one whose consequences are going to maximize pleasure and minimize pain for all people, the philosophic calculus. So, like Kant's deontology, Mill's consequentialism, first of all, seeks a general universal principle for what defines the good, also regards the good as absolutely incumbent on all people universally. Unlike Kant, though, Mill is not going to seek a general categorical imperative. It is not going to disregard the consequences of actions. Pain and pleasure, hedonism. Hmm? Let's consider hedonism. Why in the world are we here? Surely not to live in pain and fear, says John Lennon. That's an expression of hedonism. Pleasure, happiness is a moral value. We're here to enjoy, not to suffer. Objection! Hedonism. It's selfish. It's sensual. It's individualistic. It's self-seeking. Look at this. Here's an advert for Hedonism Resort in Jamaica. Ooh, I think they're up to some naughty things there. Hmm, not a good thing. Is pleasure the proper goal of human life? Not everyone agrees. Uh, it isn't for Christianity. Uh, Christ suffered. Suffering and self-denial are holy. Is it for Gandhi? Uh, you can't lead a true life without suffering, says Gandhi. Patience means self-suffering. Isn't so for Mother Teresa? The suffering of the poor is something very beautiful, and the world is being very much helped by the nobility of this example of misery and suffering. Hmm? The Buddha, on the other hand, is not in favor of suffering, but uh, the Buddha recognizes that suffering is inseparable from existence. It's self-contradictory to exist and to try to avoid suffering uh, or to seek pleasure, which is why the Buddhist idea of salvation, Nibbana, uh, sometimes mistakenly translated into the Christian concept of heaven is, is the very opposite of that. Nibbana is to cease to exist, to enter into that state, is to cease being and therefore to cease suffering and therefore to be delivered or to be saved. Very different notion of salvation than what one finds, for example, in Christianity. So once again, at the risk of being boring, I'm going to repeat. Think very carefully before ever finishing a sentence, the subject of which is religion, capital R, singular, because any such proposition is almost surely going to be false. The idea of salvation for the Buddhists, quite the opposite of the idea of salvation for the Christians. In Christianity, you survive, your soul survives, hopefully in the good place rather than the bad place. And I wake up in the morning, my feet are cold. I know at least I haven't gone there. Um, but for Buddhism, salvation means ceasing to exist in any state whatsoever. Well, hedonism, as Mill and Bentham enunciated in the 19th century, uh, very definitely means to break with the pleasure-denying morality promoted by Christianity. Um, for Christianity, a key way in which the wickedness of human nature comes out is that we pursue pleasure. We must instead learn to mortify the flesh vivify the spirit. So there's a conflict here. Mill opposed Christian asceticism, Victorian Christian ascetics, in turn excoriated Mill, who harks back to pre-Christian hedonism, the sort of thing that one finds, for example, in Epicurus or, or in Aristotle. Um, this goes back to pre-Christian ideas. Uh, Aristotle defined ethics as well-being, uh, as having a good life, rather a different goal at least the Christians would pursue. But when Mill says pleasure or happiness, this may not be the same thing. Jonathan Barnes uh, notes uh, of Aristotle, eudaimonia doesn't refer to a mental state of euphoria, as happiness tends to do in English. Hey, I'm happy, yay. To be eudaimonia is to flourish, to make success of life, but the correlation between that and ordinary happiness is an indirect one. Aristotle's approach is often called virtue ethics. Um, and if you understand virtue correctly, that's a very good description. One of the things it involves is trying to strike a golden mean. That is, there are all kinds of extremes. You don't want to go to any extreme, but you want to get a balance. So, um, for example, um, courage is a virtue, but too much courage 
becomes rashness and you charge in where angels fear to tread, maybe at a cost to you or to other people. Too little courage, cowardice, a deficiency in courage is also not a good thing. So what you want to do is to strike a happy medium, strike a balance. That's Aristotle's general sort of advice. Let's look at Stephen Fry. Uh, the actor is going to read a, a script here uh, on, uh, on Aristotle and uh, the good life. Uh, it's worth having a look at. Let's, uh, let's do that. How to live a good life? That's the basic philosophical question. Aristotle's answer was live virtuously. Do what a virtuous person would do, and that will make you happy. Well, not exactly happy, but eudaimon. Eudaimonia, sometimes translated as flourishing, is what we all want. It's the one thing people seek for its own sake. Eudaimonia isn't a matter of one or two moments of bliss. As Aristotle put it, one swallow doesn't make a summer. It's the result of a successful life lived well, together with a bit of good luck. In his Nicomachean Ethics, basically an early self-help book, he explained how to flourish by cultivating the virtues. Every virtue is a disposition to behave in certain ways that lies between two extremes. Courage, feeling the fear, but doing it anyway, lies between cowardice, when you feel the fear and can't do it, and recklessness, when you don't feel the fear, when you should. Generosity lies between stinginess, when you're mean, and profligacy, when you throw your money around, and so on. This is Aristotle's doctrine of the golden mean. Whether you can act virtuously or not in part depends on how you've been brought up, your moral education, as well as on the choices you make. If that goes well, you'll act appropriately and feel the appropriate emotions, whatever situation you find yourself in. So in its own way, Aristotle has a, an ethic of, of, of hedonism. So it's not about just, oh, I'm, I'm blissful. I'm, you know, I'm ch chasing my bliss all the time. Happiness? I'm well, not exactly happy. Uh, again, one swallow does not a summer make, you know, one fine day, similarly one day, a brief ha time of happiness does not make a person entirely happy. But if you think about it as a lifelong pursuit, that's uh, a different uh, matter. But again, why in the world are we here? Surely not to live in pain and fear. I think John Lennon is channeling Aristotle here. Uh, so is uh, this Mardi Gras crew, the Social Aid and Pleasure Club. How cool is that? Emerson says on this subject, um, the purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. Uh, he may be making here a distinction between happiness and euphoria. Um, very likely Aristotle would agree with Emerson, but it's not inconceivable, I think, that Mill might agree too. I grew up in München, and uh, we pursue gemütlichkeit, enjoyment, you know. Our idea of the, the best season of the year is Oktoberfest. Alas, this year I'm speaking to you from the early phases of the corona pandemic. Uh, Oktoberfest has been canceled, alas. But, but when it goes on, uh, everybody gets together for lots of beer. By the way, we drink our beer in one liter mugs. I came to America and people drink the, their beer in pitchers, you know. They share this thing like, in, in miniature. That one's mine, you get your own. Hmm? Um, Hygge, as the, the Scandinavians uh, sometimes say, the same sort of thing. Um, a, a feeling of, of cheerfulness and, uh, and having a good life. But there is a sharp difference, nonetheless, uh, between those who say that happiness and pleasure are the goals of human existence and those who say that this is not so. Hmm? Between Epicurus and Aristotle and Mill on the one hand, between the Christians and Gandhi and the Buddhists in their own way on the other hand. Simply as a matter of fact, is pleasure the actual goal of human existence? Nietzsche thought not. Hegel agreed with him. Uh, man, says Nietzsche, does not strive for pleasure. Only the Englishman does. He had no in mind, of course. Freud would agree with Nietzsche. Um, 
for the pleasure principle. What decides the purpose of life is simply the program of the pleasure principle, yet its program is at loggerheads with the whole world. There is no possibility of its being carried through. All the regulations of the universe run counter to it. One feels inclined to say that the intention that man should be, quote, happy, unquote, is not included in the plan of creation. Um, and, uh, and he's certainly not saying that from a religious point of view. So let's look at what Mill says, and also importantly, uh, and what Mill does not say, just as we did with Kant. Be precise about what Mill says. I think Mill is not just saying, if it feels good, do it. Although, if it don't feel good, you ain't doing it right. Hmm? Because Mill recognizes there can be a hierarchy of pleasures, there can be a high, there can be higher order versus lower order pleasures. Uh, a common objection to hedonism is that hedonism is a doctrine worthy of swine. What do we say? So and so is happy as a pig in shit. Pigs are happy in shit. They roll around. They love it. Dogs too, for that matter. Heart says I'm happy. Brain says you're an idiot. Heart says, but I'm happy. Brain says you're an idiot. Don't worry. Be happy. Hmm? Um, alas, Mills' mentor and ally, Jeremy Bentham, uh, didn't do much to dispel the swine impression in the first place. By the way, this is this is Jeremy Bentham. Um, his, uh, his head is, uh, is preserved in between his feet. Uh, his skeleton has been mounted and stuffed and a wax head put on top of it. And he's in a wooden box. Bentham left his fortune to the University of London on condition that he would always be present at meetings of the governing board. And so every time they meet, they bring in the box with Bentham and he has to be there present in the room uh, as a condition of his, uh, of his grant to them. Um, philosophers were odd people. Uh, Bentham though said at one point, oh, push pin is as good as poetry. Push pin was a child's game. You know, so whatever makes you happy, uh, you know, it's all equivalent. And it seems to suggest that anything anyone desires uh, from the most coarse to the most refined pleasures is kind of equal. Um, this is why Epictetus said uh, of, of uh, Epicurus uh, in ancient times, Hedonism promotes merely eating, drinking, copulation, evacuating, and snoring. Uh, eat, shit, sleep, repeat. You know, not much of a life. And what if Simon Blackburn asks, if the desires people have are trashy, stoked up by false promises and allurements, motivated by, motivated by vanity and self-esteem, what if their gratification turns to ashes? Um, do things go better when people gratify trivial desires that were induced in the first place by playing on their fears and fantasies. What about the gratifications of the gambler, the gratifications of the drug addict? Um, there is a sort of gratification there, but really? Think about the earlier discussion of metaphysics. Did I learn my wants or are they somehow just primordial and beyond critique, you know? Can I want to want otherwise than I do? Do they just, my wants just come down to me uh, fully formed or uh, are they influenced, uh, are they learned? Mm -hmm. Mill does have a response to the swine objection, and here it is, three, three, fourfold. First of all, few human creatures would content to be changed into any of the lower animals for the promise of the fullest allowance of a beast's pleasures. If you're a successful racehorse after a couple years of running, they put you out to stud. You get a pasture with all these mares, and you can shag them as you want. But would you really want to be a stallion? because you could shag all these mares as opposed to being a human being. No intelligent human being would consent to be a fool. No instructed person would be an ignoramus. No person of feeling and conscience would be selfish and base, even though they should be persuaded that the fool, the dunce, or the rascal is better satisfied with his lot than they are with theirs. It is better, he concludes, to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. So, also, um, another worry people have about hedonism and egoism is that it tends to be, or can tend to be, anti-social. Notice, though, that although hedonism may be sensual and individualistic, it's not necessarily either selfish or egotistical. Mill's version is both social and universal. Now, it's, of course, possible to assert selfishness as a virtue. Uh, Anne Rand is famous for this. The Virtue of Selfishness, one of her books. Me. I. Mrs. Thatcher expanded this a little bit when she made it a little less individualistic than, than Rand. It's me and mine. Who is society, she says. There is no such thing. 
there are individual men and women and there are families. But basically beyond that, um, uh, no common good, uh, nothing we would want to call society. So with respect to other people, it's every man for himself, devil take the hindmost. Mill, on the other hand, doesn't take this point of view. He has in mind the collective happiness of society and humanity as a whole. To do the good is to seek the common good. Remember, the greatest good for the greatest number. That's implicitly a social ethic, not strictly an egoistic one. Ethics is a social philosophy for Mill, in other words. Eudaimonia is not merely a personal or individual goal. It's good for me to flourish. It's also good for the rest of the population to flourish through pleasure also. Okay. This is no less true of Kant. Here also we have a social ethic. Uh, treat humanity, whether in your own person or the person of any other, be a member of the universal kingdom of ends as you individually seek the categorical imperative. Okay, Mill seems to assume that there is a common good. What if he's wrong? What if there is no common good? Why can't we all just get along? Hmm? Well, what if the economy is a zero-sum game in which the gain of the upper class is the deficit of the lower class? I mentioned Jeff Bezos a minute ago, uh, going to become a trillionaire, okay? Wealth is a commodity subject to scarcity, which means the more one person has, the less the other person has. I'm talking to you right now from downtown Los Angeles. I can look out, and I'll talk about this a little later, I can see houses built for one family in which there are eight families, at least eight families living now. And beyond that, not in my neighborhood per se, but not too many blocks away in downtown, there are people living under underpasses in tents in the, on the streets. Um, is everybody in it together? Why can't we all just get along? Is there a common good? Economically, hmm, I could raise that question. Um, or what if the common good of having more equally distributed wealth cuts against the class interests of those who already have it? What if my pleasure is your pain? Uh, Mill doesn't really address this. Uh, and these are prospects which uh, pose challenges for any, bill, any views such as Mill's, which wants to assert we could easily get to the common good. Philosophic calculus, this is Bentham's phrase. Bentham, the guy mm. with the stuffed body. Um, Felicity, happiness could be quantified and calculated, hence the name. Uh, even though precisely how to do this, the, 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 the metric for this uh, has been a bit of a mystery. Um, Mills, we've seen, tried to be critical of Bentham, but he still accepts the general outline of the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Actions, says Mill, are right in proportion, matter of proportion, as they tend to promote happiness, wrong as they tend to promote the reverse of happiness. By happiness is intended pleasure in the absence of pain, by unhappiness, pain, and the privation of pleasure. So Mill goes so far as to define moral right and wrong, good and bad, by pleasure produced and pain avoided. I act morally and when and to the extent that I maximize the sum total of pleasure in the universe. In addition for Mill, morality can and ought to be calculated. It's a matter of proportion. It's a matter of the philosophic calculus numbers matter. One way is to weigh prospective pleasures against pain in a cost-benefit analysis. The moral course of action is the one whose consequences yielded the highest ratio collectively of pleasure over pain. But how exactly do you do the math? Okay, I'm going back into ancient history here. Something happened about the time I moved to California 30 years and some change ago. The McMartin preschool trial. Anybody remember that? Uh, these were, this was a family that ran a preschool, private preschool, and they were accused of child abuse and child molestation. Uh, there was a public uproar. They uh, were, were arrested and tried uh, and punished for uh, these accusations. And one of the things that you heard at the time <clears throat> was that, well, you know, children don't lie about these things. If a child says it, it must be true. And as time passed and cooler heads prevailed, it turns out, for example, that one of the things in which this nefarious family was accused was satanic rituals uh, involving the slaughter of elephants in the classroom. Okay, sacrifice of elephants. Well, it turns out that the children who testified were 
a lot more suggestible than the people who defended their accusations at first uh, wanted to think. But the, the, the notion at the time was, and it's still um, to a certain extent active when we think about child abuse accusations, for example, among public school teachers, um, if, if it can be said, it probably happened. Uh, guilty if charged. And we better be, we better err on the side of removing people abruptly without due process from their livelihoods and maybe from their freedom, um, lest, lest we err on the other side. Um, so that do individuals' happinesses count for one quantum of happiness each? Well, in the case of certain people, uh, they don't, they outweigh it. You know, if it helps even one child, it was all worth it, no matter what the consequences to the adults who are charged with these offenses. Uh, under this way of doing the calculus, child always trumps adult. Uh, any one, one single child trumps any number of adults. So that's one possible calculus. In 1942, near Prague, uh, Czech and Slovak partisans assassinated uh, Obergruppenführer Reinhard Heydrich of the SS. He was a very bad hat. Um, Heydrich was, uh, was in charge, for example, of the Wannsee Conference um, earlier that year uh, in, uh, in Berlin, where the, the Holocaust was basically worked out. The details were worked out. Eichmann was there, but, but Heydrich was in charge. Um, a very nasty piece of work. And uh, the partisans got it. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> in retaliation for that, the German army executed 13 thousand people, including almost the entire Czech village of Legice, and any relatives of the assassins that they could find. Hmm? Ordinarily, the Nazis would kill 10 to 15 people if there was a partisan attack, for example, uh, killed a German soldier, then they would round up, you know, 10 or 15 civilians. 13,000 was their way of doing this philosophic calculus at that time. In India today, um, the BJP, uh, the Hindu Nationalist Party, is ginning up its space um, in the following way. Here is the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh. If they kill even one Hindu, we will kill, and the crowd goes, 100. How's that for call and response? Hmm? Again, a philosophic calculus, very out of proportion. Uh, if Facebook were a country, it would have the largest population on earth, more than 2.2 billion people, about a third of humanity, log in at least once a month. 14 years after it was founded in Zuckerberg's dorm room, Facebook has as many adherents as Christianity. As many adherents as Christianity. China has a population 1.48 billion, uh, India 1.38, um, and Facebook has 2.2. Wow, um, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of influence. In 2016, a man named Anthony Perkins was shot fatally on Facebook Live. And the following day, Facebook vice president offered the following philosophic calculus to justify their running that, uh, that uh, uh, video. Well, maybe it cost a life by exposing someone to bullies. Maybe someone dies in a terrorist attack coordinated on our tools. And still we connect people. Hmm? The ugly truth is that we believe in connecting people so deeply that anything that allows us to connect more people more often is de facto good. Of course, he said this not for public consumption. The, the video of him saying that to the, to the staff members leaked out. Ugly truth? Well, it may be ugly, but is it true? 2 million, 200,000, uh, 2 billion, 200 million, sorry, Facebook users outweigh one murdered man. Uh, 13,000 Czech civilians in exchange for one Nazi, 100 Muslims for every Hindu. If I might conceivably save one child, no amount of damage to any adult life is too high, high a price to pay. Hmm. If on the other hand, even if numbers count, uh, perhaps there are more sophisticated ways to do this. Uh, Sir William Blackstone, um, basic principle of the common law, which, which we uh, adhere to in this country as well uh, as in Britain. Uh, better that 10 guilty persons escape than that one innocent suffer. If you have to err, and we will make mistakes, then err on the side of leniency rather than on the side of punishment. So one can do the calculus uh, 
it's not easy to figure out how to do the numbers in, in quite a variety of ways. Let's come back to the example of the sailor we looked at in terms of Kant. Okay. What would Mill say is the right thing to do? Sailor checks his 45 with the bartender, then he gets drunk, wants it back. Hmm? Should the bartender give it to him or say, I forgot where I put it, I don't know where it is, it's gone, whatever. Well, okay, lying to the sailor is likely to produce the greatest good for the greatest number. The guy who wasn't shot, the sailor is not going to hang for murder. Now, lying is not generally good. We could concede that, but lying is not generally bad either. Much depends on the consequences. Individual cases need to be assessed not on any generalized one size fits all maxim, but on a case by case basis in accordance with one basic principle how to maximize happiness. Back to the trolley problem. Yes, it's a painful tragedy if one person dies. It's a painful tragedy if five people die, but there, there the pain is greater. Um, so to maximize, you know, sorry, to minimize pain or maximize pleasure, that's the morally right thing to do, so pull the switch. The consequence of not pulling the switch, of doing what Kant would suggest to do, is wrong, it's morally wrong. It's wrong because the quantity of suffering experienced by these five people outweighs that experience by the one who gets spared. So, the philosophic calculus. It's a calculus in that numbers matter morally. It's hedonistic calculus of happiness because pleasure happiness defines goodness. Okay. In 1945, to end World War II, uh, President Harry Truman of the United States dropped uh, an atom bomb, uh, first on Hiroshima, and uh, then a second one on Nagasaki. Uh, the Japanese surrendered, the war was ended. Hiroshima. This is one of the consequences of Hiroshima. Hiroshima. Was it a good thing for President Truman to drop these bombs or was it a bad thing? Well, here's a guy who makes a case for the former, that it was a good thing. Paul Fussell, thank God for the atom bomb. Uh, Fussell wrote an essay by this title, which is the, uh, in a collection of essays by the same title. Fussell was, um, a professor of English uh, for the longest time at uh, Penn's, uh, University of Pennsylvania, I think then at Princeton toward the end of his life. He, was, he, was, he died a few years ago. Um, but Paul Fussell had a reason for saying uh, the atom bomb uh, was a good thing. Um, it, ad it ended World War II. It did so by mass death, anywhere between 90,000 and 200 civilians in Hiroshima alone, and there was Nagasaki also. Maximum alone from both about a quarter of a million, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, quarter of a million people dead. Had the bomb not been used, there might have been more Japanese killed up to that same quarter million uh, because they would have resisted invasion to the last man and perhaps twice that many Americans into the bargain. So three times as many dead total if the bomb had not been dropped and if the invasion of the Japanese home islands had gone on. And again, Fussell had a dog in this fight. 1945, he was an infantry lieutenant. He'd been wounded badly in the uh, Hurtigan Forest, I think, in Europe. War was over in the European theater, and these guys were being shipped across the United States to the West Coast, ready to be deployed to invade Japan. They'd, they'd already beat Hitler. They'd already done so at tremendous cost, personal cost. They'd already beat the odds and survived it. Now they're going to have to do it all over again. So yeah, a lot of guys like Paul Fussell, when they heard that the bomb was dropped, they said, thank God for the atom bomb. That was their point of view, the widespread point of view it was. Okay, what would Mill and Kant say? Now I put this, uh, because he didn't actually say this, obviously he didn't know about Hiroshima anymore, they knew about the trolley problem. So I put this in um, uh, sort of dotted quotation marks, um, or dotted quotation bubble. But I think Mill would say something like this. Dropping the bomb was a morally good act. It was not only the lesser of two evils, it was a positive good. On balance, it increases the amount of happiness for all and decreases the amount of misery, which is just what defines moral good. So given the numbers, it's a no brainer. Uh, three quarters of a million is greater than a quarter million. Hmm? I think Kant would have a reply also. And again, I'm imagining this, but I imagine that it would go like this. Even with the numbers, Kant would say, it would be immoral to drop the bomb. Unless you can will that everyone in a tight situation should drop it, and you can't do that, then it should not be done, even if it saves many lives. Now, we don't need to suppose that 
one or another of these views automatically solves the problem. It is a complex issue. I think a part of the part of the complexity is uh, would have dropping the bomb on Hiroshima alone have done the trick? Why did Truman drop the second bomb? He might not have had to do that. And there are all kinds of you know all kinds of arguments about such issues. But they do give us competing and general principles on which we might consider any such decision. Um, Kant's option would preserve Truman's moral purity. The cost would be to sit by and watch three quarters of a million people die instead of a quarter million. And some of those would be his own people, not just the enemy. Mill's option would be to have Truman embrace the action of directly causing the death of that quarter million in order to save um, you know, the lives of, of a bunch of others. Um, if one has to choose, is it better to preserve moral purity or to minimize harm? Well, um, as the atom bomb example suggests, the flip side of embracing the greatest good might be to embrace the lesser of two evils. Voltaire would advise us, don't let the best become the enemy of the good. If I can't get perfection, shouldn't I just at least do something good? Kant, on the other hand, uh, is pig-headed. Um, Forget about Bohr's head, we got Kant's head. Don't compromise, compromise elsewhere. Those who take Mill's position against Kant might point out that there are certain advantages to this. Kant gives a counsel of perfection, but we live in an imperfect world. He doesn't want any compromise, but sometimes pigheadedness may be good, sometimes it's not. <clears throat> it could be irresponsible to ignore uh, consequences entirely. Kant defines uh, avoiding consequences as morality, but from Mill's point of view, that's just immorality. Uh, is that really what we should mean by ethics? Okay, so we can now summarize Mill. Hedonism, pleasure is the basis of the good. Not everybody agrees with him here. The pleasure for Mill is absolute and universal. Objection, isn't this a doctrine of swine for the selfish? Mill says no, there are hierarchies of pleasures and hedonism is social. It's the greatest good for the greatest number. The philosophic calculus, numbers do count morally. Pleasure is an absolute good, but Mill is a little more flexible than Kant. Sometimes lying can be good, you know, consider circumstances, consider consequences. But above all, don't let the perfect become the enemy of the good. Do the good. So in short, the object view says that good is done from duty. The good is to do the right thing, whatever that might be. And for Kant, the good is to will the universal. From the consequentialist point of view, Mills in particular, the good is to maximize happiness, to minimize suffering or pain. You try to do the greatest good for the greatest number and don't allow the perfect to become the enemy of the good. So in philosophy, we have here one ancient and two modern ways of looking at ethics. So we get the translation. There are virtue ethics, there are duty ethics, there are utilitarian ethics, also known as consequentialism. And by the way, you should be the guy with the notebook there taking notes. And imagine Mill coming to Kant's birthday party and spoiling it. Oh, trick candles. These are immoral, Mill. Oh, come on. Look around the party. Everyone's enjoying the joke. How can you be, can it be immoral then? Surely their enjoyment outweighs you being annoyed. It doesn't matter that people enjoy it. It's wrong no matter what. Okay. Further on the trolley problem. Is it just a human problem? No. Consider self-driving cars, which we're getting into now. Suppose a crash is inevitable between two of these cars. Should the self-driven car make the decision to steer in such a way that it makes the utilitarian decision that one person dies rather than five? Now, it's one thing for a human being to make that decision on the spot. It's another thing for human programmers to program software so that it will inevitably make that decision under a certain set of circumstances. That's a whole set of problems that Mill hadn't even contemplated, but they're with us today. Trolleyology, uh, the trolley problem has become a uh, uh, subject of not, not only uh, philosophical discussion, but also psychological research as a whole. If you want to read, Slate has a whole article on that. Um, let's come back to the trolley problem for a minute um, and think about it in terms, first of all, uh, of, of John Rawls' view about the veil of ignorance, uh, because that's one of the conditions, uh, although it's not explicitly stated, but it's there in the trolley problem. Here again, Stephen Fry. Uh, the actor uh, to, uh, from BBC Four. What's your blueprint for a just society? Your answer probably reflects who you are and the situation you find yourself in. If you're rich, 
you may well be in favor of the freedom to earn and enjoy the fruits of your efforts. If you're poor, you're likely to be more supportive of a system that redistributes wealth. Now answer the same question with this twist. You won't know what kind of a person you'll be in the society you design. What you have to do is construct it from behind a veil of ignorance. You might end up black, white, in a wheelchair, straight, gay, born into a wealthy family, or living in extreme poverty. You might enjoy knitting, rock music, opera, tiddlywinks, or cage fighting, maybe even all of these. You just don't know how you'll end up. This is the thought experiment at the heart of John Rawls's book, A Theory of Justice. He argued that from behind the veil, we had opt for a much fairer society than we now have. There would be extensive freedom and fair equality of opportunity, but there wouldn't be extremes of high pay unless it could be shown that the poorest in society directly benefited as a result. Yes, if I don't have a dog in the fight, if I don't know that I have a dog in the fight, would I make different decisions than otherwise I do? Um, underlying Rawls' account of justice is that we need to think of individuals as abstract bearers of rights. And Kant and Mill do more or less the same thing. Rawls just spells it out. For Kant, we ought to treat humanity, whether in our own person or the person of another, in identical ways. So we're all kind of abstract humans. For Mill, the happiness of each individual counts equally. So again, we're all abstract individuals. Thinking of individuals as abstract bearers of rights, however, requires unthinking. Um, we have to ignore uh, for the moment the fact that no one lives this way. No one lives as an abstract individual. We live as particular persons. We have tastes, desires, you know, we mentioned, you know, various kinds of sexuality, economic status, all this kind of stuff. Uh, we have, uh, if you like the current jargon, the particular identities and the veil of ignorance asks us to think beyond uh, the, any, any identity whatsoever uh, and to think about persons and ourselves simply as bearers, abstract bearers of rights rather than in all the particularities which we in fact uh, find ourselves. The basic trolley problem too assumes a veil of ignorance. Uh, well, again, the formulation doesn't use these terms. One doesn't know any particulars, only that there are five people and one person and each is an abstract bearer of rights. And of course, then when you go on to, to ring the changes, you can change some of those assumptions, you know, if Flanders is there and, and, and Homer Simpson is on the track, et cetera, et cetera. Um, say five innocents and a dog or kill one enemy, that's a different problem. And one can add other circumstances, you know, uh, so that the, the decision uh, is not a win-win. Uh, Judith Thompson, I mentioned, gives a twist. Um, suppose there's a fat man on a bridge and instead of pulling a switch, you could just push that fat man in front of the trolley and maybe save the five people and the one person on the siding too, for that matter. Um, let's look at um, uh, here. Uh, this is Harry Shearer now uh, doing uh, also the, one of the same series of BBC4 uh, on the trolley problem from a slightly different angle than we have so far approached it. Runaway train is heading towards five workers on a railway line. There's no way of warning, but you're standing near a lever that operates some points. Switch the points, and the train goes down a spur. Trouble is, there's another worker on that bit of track, too. But it's one fatality instead of five. Should you do that? Many people think the right thing to do would be to switch the points, to sacrifice one to save five, since that produces the best outcome possible. Now imagine the train heading for the workers again. This time it can only be stopped by pushing a very large man off a bridge. His great bulk would stop the train, but he'd die. Should you do that? Most people say no. But why not? Both thought experiments are cases of sacrificing one to save five. What the trolley problem examines is whether moral decisions are simply about outcomes or about the manner in which you achieve them. Some utilitarians argue that the two cases are not importantly different from each other. Both have similar consequences, and consequences are all that really matter. In each case, one person dies, and five are saved. The best option in each harrowing situation. But lots of people say they would switch the points, but they wouldn't push the man off the bridge. Are they simply inconsistent, or are they onto something?
Hmm. So there's a different twist to the trolley problem. Um, why might one and the same person have such competing intuitions that it could be right to pull the switch, but wrong to pull the, to push the fat man? Um, again, you know, the, numerically the results are the same if it's just a philosophic calculus. Could it be that philosophy is not the last word on ethics? Both Mill and Kant, uh, as we've seen, put forward philosophical ethics. They represent the two modern options, but philosophers don't have monopoly uh, in any case. Religions, for example, tend to have ethical views. Um, we've seen a little bit about the conflict uh, between uh, those views and Mill's hedonism. All cultures, again, have some ideas of right and wrong, what we might call folk moralities. We'll come back to that in a minute. As the video we just watched suggested, um, we may hold moral intuitions which are neither logically consistent with one another nor necessarily consistent with developed positions in moral philosophy. We've also seen in the case of Kant, and we'll shortly see again in the case of Mill, sometimes the ethical views of philosophers do comport with people's intuitions of right and wrong, but sometimes they do not. In addition to individual moral intuitions, we may also hold collective folk moralities. I noted from the outset, all cultures have some ideas of moralities and ethics, but uh, philosophers will not necessarily be uh, prepared to endorse any one of these. Um, yet people may act according to them. The moral principles from which humans act might or might not themselves have explicit philosophical justifications. They might just be a matter of socially shared intuitions. They may or may not coincide with the major philosophical ideas in ethics and may or may not, for that matter, correspond to any official views, including the doctrines of the religious groups to which the people uh, so acting adhere. I'll give you an example of that uh, presently. But let's look at altruism. We mentioned that a little earlier. Altruism is an example of a folk morality which has at best minimal philosophical backing. It doesn't correspond certainly to either of the two main traditions that we've outlined so far. The word altruism comes from the Latin word alter, which means other. It represents a family of moral views in which the good is to live for other people rather than for oneself. And what's the opposite of altruism? Uh, altruism is selflessness. The opposite is selfishness. Um, if one is altruistic, one prefers the benefit to others while denying benefits to oneself. It's not the case that there are no altruists among working philosophers. There are Peter Singer is a good example. Um, and Derek Parfit, uh, or late Derek Parfit is another singer still with us. Um, Singer's uh, uh, classic take, uh, if you saw a child drowning in a pond, wouldn't you run in there and save the child even if you ruined a good pair of shoes? Of course you would. Well, what's the difference between a child dying, you know, uh, halfway around the world and the child dying within sight. Uh, why wouldn't you divest yourself of your wealth in order to save children dying in far off places? On this view, it's good to be selfless, even self-sacrificing. It's bad to be selfish. So New Year's resolution, put God first, put others second, put self last. But we can raise the question, is it possible simultaneously to do good and to do well? Or if I do the right thing, must I always do so to my disadvantage? Is suffering evidence that I'm doing good? Is prospering evidence that I'm doing wrong? Um, psychologically, perhaps the most extreme form of altruism comes about from the assumption that since self-sacrifice is good, if I'm feeling pleasure, I must be in the wrong. I'm not doing good unless I personally suffer for it. So this guy, Gave up chocolate for Lent. Is suffering evidence that I'm doing good? Is prospering evidence that I'm doing wrong? This lady here, oh, over, gave up Lent for chocolate. Um, here's a good question. Do you cook for yourself? Do you cook for yourself? I have a good friend. Uh, she's a very good cook. I know this because she has over for, for Christmas dinner every year and puts on a good spread. And she, other times we've been there. But if she's by herself, and she's a widow, um, just eating by herself, she doesn't cook, you know, she eats over the sink uh, or out of a pot or, or, you know, snacks or nibbles or whatever. It's important to cook for other people, but unimportant to cook for me. Um, this is a common example of um, altruism as a folk rally. Now, I cook for myself all the time. I like food and I learned to cook. I thought that I really enjoy it. I mean, it's, it's just pleasurable, but I learned to cook when I was in, uh, in, in university as a means of self-defense. 
uh, to protect myself from the kind of uh, Italian pornography that roommates would put together with a box of noodles and some uh, ragu from a jar. But um, I cook whether, whether it's myself or anybody else. And if you come to my house and you put your feet under my table, you're going to eat every bit as well as I do. I'm going to treat you as well as I treat myself. Uh, of course I cook when I'm alone. Um, again. So basically, um, one can take the point of view, keep calm and pamper yourself. Treat yourself well, but treat other people the same. Remember Kant, uh, treat humanity, whether in your own person or the person of any other, as an end and not as a means only. In duty, you owe yourself no less than another the same measure of respect and dignity. So Kant uh, clearly is not on the side of altruism. What did Rabbi Hillel famously say? Oh, I guess I better read the translation. Um, if I am not for myself, who will be? If I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? Yeah, but if I'm not for myself, who will be? Um, does this necessarily mean to be for yourself selfishly? The notion that other trumps self doesn't figure at all in the major ethical systems, either of Kant or Mill. On the contrary, Kant assumes that ethical action is enlightened self-interest. Mill's hedonism certainly is itself denying either. On the other hand, the idea of altruism has not been without critical discussion entirely. The term itself was coined by Auguste Comte, a social thinker who's credited with the, uh, the founding of sociology, although he did not coin the term sociology. Uh, that came later. The contrast with altruism is egoism. Hmm? Um, and Comte does, does this in the context of a response to several major changes that were taking place in European society. Uh, the French Revolution and, and the overturn of traditional authority, the Industrial Revolution and the dark satanic mills uh, it brought in its wake. Comte founded a viewpoint known as positivism. And this was meant to be a, a doctrine in sociology. It was the original doctrine in sociology, but it was also meant to be a social philosophy. Comte was one of those French conservatives of the mid 19th century. He worried about uh, the excessive, uh, what they saw as excessive and negativist individualism that came about from the French Revolution, from the mercantile and industrial revolutions represented by England, um, the notion of rights undergirded by the British theory, uh, C.B. McPherson calls possessive individualism. And so in response to that, in opposition to that, Kant formulated what he called a positivist catechism. That's an interesting choice of words, isn't it? Morality, uh, the morality of altruism, quote, as he says, cannot tolerate the notion of rights, for such notion rests on individualism. To live for others is the definitive formula of human morality. Man must serve humanity, capital H, humanity, whose we are entirely. Catechism of positivism. Uh, Thomas Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, uh, said famously of Comte's uh, positivism, this is Catholicism minus Christianity, all the uh, ritual and, and uh, formal structure without the content. Um, Simone Weil, uh, Christian existentialist philosopher, uh, none of us has rights, but each one of us has a near infinite degree of duty and obligation to the other. One cannot imagine St. Francis of Assisi talking about rights, she says. Uh, to her credit, I suppose, Weil was consistent about this. Um, some people don't have a bed to sleep in, she wouldn't sleep in her bed, she slept on the floor. Some people don't have food, she stopped eating, starved herself to death in 1943 during the war. Um, she was an altruist. If altruism is to be interpreted in Comte's own fashion, it would subordinate individual happiness to self or self-interest to serving in the collective, maybe not quite so uh, radically as Simone Weil, but, but nevertheless. Individualism would be the opposite of morality. You know, unlike for Mill, for whom morality is defined as the individual calculus of consequences, also unlike for Kant, for whom the individual ability to reason is at the heart of moral action. What is it that tells me about my duty? Not the priest, not the drill sergeant, not mommy or daddy, my ability to figure it out and your ability to figure it out and everybody's ability as individuals to figure it out. For Comte, altruistic duties outweigh egoistic rights. Rights? Would St. Francis say anything like that? Different though the otherwise may be for Kant and Mill, it's always the free individual who makes moral choices. 
Comte's formulation uh, suggests the roots in Christianity of his altruism. And altruism has been attractive subsequently to certain religious thinkers inclined to see the figure of Jesus as the archetypal man for others. This is a phrase from the uh, German Protestant theologian, for example, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, who was uh, incidentally a resistor to Hitler. He was hanged uh, just at the end of the war by the Nazi regime. Um, Catholics agree with Protestants here. St. Ignatius, a man for others. Uh, Maximilian Kolbe, the saint of Auschwitz, he was on the, uh, on the other side of the divide from Bonhoeffer, but also uh, resisted. Uh, Hitler was also killed, uh, in this case, one of the death camps. Only by being a man or woman for others, says Pedro Arupe, former uh, uh, Jesuit superior general, does one become fully human. What is Jesus saying? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, says it in the Gospel according to St. Mark, Gospel according to St. Matthew. Of course, he's quoting uh, Tanakh uh, Leviticus, as uh, Rabbi Hillel might point out to us. But was even Jesus a total altruist? It seems as Rabbi Hillel says, you have to love yourself first if you want to follow this particular commandment. Love your neighbor, but love your neighbor as yourself. Treat humanity, whether in your own person or the person of any other, uh, never just as a means to an end, but also as an end withal. There are religious takes on altruism. There are non-religious takes on altruism. Uh, Adam Smith, famously, the invisible hand of the market. It's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, the baker, we expect at dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. So everybody pursues, if you will, Gordon Gecko's creed of greed, and everybody goes for their own profit and their own benefit. But guess what? Miraculously, the common good emerges. The brewer produces uh, the beer, the baker, the bread, the butcher, the meat. We all have dinner and they all profit too into the bargain. Um, so there are latent, so Smith, latent social, uh, be latent and beneficial social effects from the manifest division of labor in which people pursue self-interest. There's this famous invisible hand of his, at least so he says. Uh, Nietzsche has another take on altruism. We'll see this when we come to the very last lecture in this course. Uh, Nietzsche, no fan of Christianity, uh, no fan of the ethics of Christianity, uh, in particular the altruistic side represented, for example, by the Sermon on the Mount. Um, altruism, Nietzsche thinks, is the ethic of a slave. It's unworthy of free people. The slave makes all the rest of the world his master. He bows down to all others in preference to himself. This is nonsense, says Nietzsche. Um, and it, 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 it undermines ourselves, it hinders our self-development. Um, and other people have raised the issue too, is there a difference between naked self-seeking and enlightened self-seeking? Can there be, uh, you know, can you do good and do well simultaneously? So let's consider how some of these ideas might work out in, in application. When might self-sacrifice be a good thing? Suppose one agrees that altruism self-sacrifice is a good thing, um, including one's own life. Here's an example. PFC James Anderson, United States Marine Corps, awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor uh, in Viet for action in Vietnam in 1967. A hand grenade came into a foxhole he occupied with some buddies. He threw himself on top of the grenade, absorbed the blast, killed him, saved his buddies. Medal of Honor. Did PFC Anderson commit suicide. Hmm. Well, clearly he acted so as to bring about his own death. He caused his own death. One way to say that even though he did that, he did not commit suicide was to invoke, is to invoke the doctrine known as a double effect. This goes back to St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, it's a for, sort of prototypical way of distinguishing between intentions and effects. Um, we can distinguish, uh, says this point of view, from the consequences of an act and the intentions that might motivate it. If the primary intention of him throwing himself in his grenade was to kill himself, well, yes, that would have been suicide. And of course, the Catholic Church takes a different view of that. But if his primary intention was to save his buddies, that's good. And if it's simply a side consequence that he dies in the process, well, okay, that's a consequence. That's, that's unfortunate. But if it wasn't the primary intention, then it's not morally uh, blamable. You know, this is a useful consequence for lots of things. Suppose I crashed my tree, my car into a tree accidentally, I caused injury. Was it my primary intention to crash my car and cause injury? No. If it was a secondary consequence, if this was collateral damage, well, then moral blame gets uh, uh, applied in different ways. So 
how would the various points of view interpret the morality of what PFC Anderson did? Well, I think everybody, including folk wisdom, would approve of him you know, deciding to sacrifice his life in order to save his friends. Um, Kant says, can we will that everyone do this? If we can, to the extent that we can, yes, then he did a good thing. Aquinas would say with a double effect, well, he was trying to save his friends, not kill himself. So yes, he did a good thing. Um, the folk wisdom of altruism would say, yes, uh, he acted for others. That's a good thing. Mill would say he saved a larger number of his buddies. So that was a good thing. So for different sorts of reasons, uh, different people could look on this one uh, identical act and come to uh, the same basic sort of judgment, although again, differently uh, arrived at. Um, these four points of view would agree that what P.F.C. Anderson did was morally praiseworthy. Now let's take another example. Not one soldier, but two. Privates Willie and Joe, uh, they were characters in uh, Bill Maudlin's uh, um, cartoon strip that ran in the uh, sorry, Stars and Stripes of the ETO World War II, and they're very popular with the men because they, they you know, they saw the war as the soldier saw it. Um, anyway, what if they're in a foxhole and Private Willie throws Private Joe on the grenade? Now, that saves Private Willie and it saves all their buddies too, it has the same effect as PFC Anderson. But many people would regard this a, as not a praiseworthy act. Um, they would not, but Private uh, Willie would not get the Congressional Medal of Honor. He would get U.S. Army Disciplinary Barracks Fort Leavenworth. Um, Kant would say, can we will that everybody sacrifice other people this way? No, of course not. So that's wrong. Aquinas would say, well, you know, this is bad overall. It's nullified because the evil means that he chose outweighed the good intention. Um, the altruist would say, you know, um, Private Willie acted to, for, to, to, in his own self-interest and this is bad. Mill, though, would say, well, okay, the same number of people are alive, the same number of people were saved, and only one person was sacrificed. The numbers are the same. So what Private Willie did is a good thing, the same way that what P.F.C. Anderson did was a good thing. So Mill's quantitative consequentialism would be uniquely out of step with ordinary moral intuitions, with folk morality, as well as with other uh, moral theories. Um, once again, sometimes the ethical views of uh, philosophers do comport with people's intuitions, sometimes they do not. Why is the P.S.C. Edison case different from the Private Willie case? Well, we seem to have this moral intuition that I own my own life. Whose life is it anyway? So I can choose to sacrifice it in a good cause in a way that I never own another person's life and can never sacrifice it. And so common moral intuition too would support P.S.C. Anderson throwing himself on the grenade, but not Private Willie throwing Private Joe instead. However, there were periods in history when I did not own my own life in this way. There was a time in which if you tried to commit suicide and you failed, you would be hanged. Why? Because you tried to commit murder on the person of one of the king's subjects, and you do not have the right to kill any of the king's subject, whether in your own person or the person of another. Hmm. Yeah, so you could be hanged for failed suicide. You didn't have the right to commit suicide. I think we wouldn't do that today. Um, uh, it's interesting the, 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 how people think of suicide. The, the French say suicide, just like we say suicide, it comes from a common Latin root. The Germans have a couple of words. Well, one of them does come from the Latin root, but the most common word I think the Germans use for suicide, this is interesting, is Selbstmord, which literally means self-murder. Now, murder isn't the same as killing. We'll come to this when we talk about um, uh, the, uh, the Eudifro uh, dialogue of Plato. Um, murder is unjustified homicide. You can commit homicide and it might be justified self-defense, time of war, etc. Murder is a specific case of homicide in which there's no justification. But the German word builds this judgment into the very word itself. It's not just, you have killed yourself, suicide. Uh, you have murdered yourself. So, you know, attitudes can vary on this. Should we blame a murderer? Dinsdale Piranha, uh, one of the infamous Piranha brothers, put on trial for murder and um, a psychologist is called to the witness stand to testify in his behalf. Uh, this is Monty Python, here it goes. It's easy for us to judge Dinsdale Piranha too harshly. After all, he only did what most of us, most of us simply dream of doing. After all, a murder, a murderer is only 
only an extroverted suicide. A murderer is only an extroverted suicide. Hmm? I have the right to commit suicide, so why not murder? I guess reference there to um, Dr. Strangelove <laughs> as well. When might self-sacrifice be a good thing? When might it be a bad thing? Well, parents want to make self-sacrifices for their children. You know, I'm having another mashed potato sandwich for lunch, but the kids' college fund is growing, so that's good. But what if your self-sacrifice makes your children orphans? Is there a limit beyond which you don't want to sacrifice yourself? General Patton hit the nail on the head uh, when he said this to his troops. I want you to remember that no bastard ever won a war by dying for his country. He won it by making the other poor dumb bastard die for his country. Mm, yes, your duty is not to die for your country. Finally, ethics, should it be prescriptive or descriptive? Um, consider the prospect that people may follow moral rules which are at odd, odds with their prescriptive moral teachings to which they supposedly adhere. Uh, the point to grasp is that from a descriptive point of view, such people are not behaving immorally or amorally, they're behaving morally. Uh, just in unexpected ways. Here's a case in point. About, oh gosh, 35 years ago now, uh, interesting research finding. Roman Catholic women are more likely than Jewish women or Protestant women to have abortions. Um, wow, what's wrong with this picture? It's paradoxical in that the Roman church officially condemns abortion as a grave mortal sin. And the reasoning for this is the concept is that's a kind of an umbrella term for fetus and embryo uh, is fully a person has a soul with full moral and civil rights from the point of conception. Hmm? And most recently it's applied, uh, it's adjusted its views in light of scientific biology in, in which at no point in the continuum of pregnancy from conception to birth can be held to be morally relevant. It's a process, uh, but it remains adamantly against abortion, uh, period. Protestantism doesn't operate with the concept of mortal sin in the same way. And Protestant groups have varied on whether they approve or disapprove the decision to abort. Liberal Protestants tend to support the right to abort. Conservative Protestants in the past have joined forces, well, have opposed the Catholic Church. They joined forces recently with the Catholic Church. You know, there was a time when folks like Jerry Falwell and Baptists and others at the fundamentalists would say, oh, the Pope, he is the Antichrist. Um, and we want nothing to do, you know, with that, that uh, the network of sin. But on the abortion issue, they came around to common ground and they formed coalitions and, and uh, conservative Catholics marched with conservative Pro Protestants to picket abortion clinics, for example. Judaism has never taken sides, certainly not in the way that, that Catholicism has. Um, those in the reform branch of Judaism, which is most Jews in America, tend to be political liberals, tend to support the right of woman to, uh, to procure abortion uh, as she chooses. So of which of these denominations are women most likely to obtain abortion? Catholic women. Uh, one might expect based on prescriptive doctrine alone, Roman Catholics would have low abortions, maybe none. Protestants would have some abortions, some abstentions. Jews would have relatively many abortions, fewer abstentions. But what, what one finds on the contrary is that Roman Catholics have relatively higher abortions, not relatively lower abortion rates. So when this happens, researchers were puzzled. They turn up, you know, um, uh, paradoxical findings. So they want to inquire some more. They want to do some follow up. This is very common. My friend Kristen Luker, who did um, uh, research on the abortion clinic in, back in the 70s now, um, found that some of the same women kept coming back for multiple abortions. And these were not, you know, un un uneducated, ignorant women, you know, just, just discovered what's been causing it. These were highly educated women. And they, you might think, okay, you know, they have an unexpected pregnancy once they take care of it, and then they ensure that it doesn't happen again but they kept coming back again and again. So she, you know, you find if finding out this, you follow up an interview, she did. And what she found was that the reasoning was this, well, lightning can't strike twice, you know? I got accidentally pregnant before. Okay, it was a fluke thing, but it can't happen again. Can't happen again. Yes, it can every single month, you know? Basic biology, but, you know, people don't always reason that way. So here too, uh, the researchers um, went back to query the Catholic women. So why did you? Uh, why did you have uh, an abortion? Uh, what did they discover when they redirected? They discovered this: 
a lot of the women independently of each other said, well, you know, using birth control is up to 21, 28 sins per month, maybe as many as that. Abortion is only one occasional sin. So in other words, these Roman Catholic women are reasoning like John Stuart Mill. They're doing the philosophic calculus. Now that is what the Catholic Church adamantly opposes, you know. St. Thomas Aquinas would lose his hair. Well, actually, he would lost his hair. Um, this is nuts. He might say the church could never condone, could, could condone this philosophic calculus. Um, the lesser of two evils would still be an evil. So um, it's uh, interesting the way in which morality works out. And then we come to the topic of, of social or distributive justice. Uh, eudaimonia. May we not then confidently pronounce that man happy, eudaimon, who realizes complete goodness in action and is adequately furnished with external goods. Some people think of ethics as preachy, thou shalt not. Some people think of ethics as ascetic, denying life or pleasure. But the Greeks did not, Aristotle included. They thought of ethics rather as how can we live the good life? How can humans flourish? Hmm? And notice, by the way, that Aristotle does not say that eudaimonia is just spiritual or uh, disembodied or psychological. Human flourishing for Aristotle is to be provided with a good share of the external goods of the world. So it's far from a self-denying ascetic kind of proposition. Um, Karl Marx and uh, as well as John Stuart Mill might be seen to be channeling Aristotle in this respect. Marx, if he's remembered today, is uh, remembered for one of two main things that he said. Uh, he said, that capitalism is a system of economic exploitation of unequal exchange. Again, in the last lecture of this class, we'll talk a bit about Marx and how he comes to these conclusions. But um, he claims, for example, that even when a worker is being paid a fair wage, they're still being exploited. As long as profit is being taken, there is theft going on behind the back. Even when wages are fair, they're still exploitative. And capitalism is a system that runs on profit and therefore it runs on exploitation. If people remember Marx today, and a lot of people don't, but if they do, this is the thing for which they remember. But he also said something else. Capitalism is also an engine for economic prosperity unrivaled in human history. And he was impressed by both of these facts. One he found appalling, the other he found amazing. It is indeed the case that human flourishing has increased dramatically during the Industrial Revolution, during the demographic transition, during the growth of capitalism, that is what's happened in the last 200 and some years. Here's a family around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, so Karl Hamsing married Bertha Binsky. They had eight children and they all, they didn't die in childhood. They all survived. Well, in that day and age, that was still not an unusual number of people, uh, uh, children to have for, for a couple. Um, uh, two children is more the norm, 2.5, uh, declining now in, in later times. But we went through a demographic transition in which the death rate uh, decreased at first and the birth rate took a while to decrease, birth rate represented by the green line, but that's essentially what happened. Uh, this couple we just looked at had not quite gone through that even by the end of the 20th century. Most of us have gone through that, uh, certainly in industrial societies. Immigrants go through that uh, also in becoming acclimated to industrial societies. Um, death rates decreased dramatically followed by an equally dramatic increase in birth rates. And this leads in the, in the, in the long run, if not in the short run, to uh, increase in the quality of life. Um, Throughout most of human history, no one would be lucky enough to reach age 30, or one would be lucky, I mean, so many people wouldn't. Uh, 50, you were an old man. Um, life was uh, poor, nasty, British, and short. Steven Pinker uh, has an interesting, uh, somewhat controversial book, um, Enlightenment Now, in which he talks about these sorts of issues. And except perhaps for the hairstyle, uh, Pinker has little in common with Marx, but he agrees with Marx here. Material human flourishing has made tremendous progress in modern times. Here's a list of things from, um, from that uh, book. Um, you can read those at your leisure. You can either pause the video or you can read the PDF when it comes uh, as a class handout. Um, let's look at this.
wow, that's a sobering statistic. Every three seconds a child dies of extreme poverty. But here's another statistic, the quintuple A number. Ever heard of it? Probably haven't. Uh, John Lanchester, who uh, writes on economics, uh, he's not a formal economist, which is part of the reason he's interested, um, gives it this name, the quintuple A number, so that it comes at the very head of his glossary alphabetically. Here's what it is. It's a term I've just made up, he says, but it denotes an actual number, 16,438. The most important statistic in the world, but this isn't the famous fact, the famous success, it's the number of children under five who are not dying every day compared with the number who were dying daily in 1990. From 12.6 million to 6. million deaths a year, total of 6 million children's lives saved every year. Why isn't this as famous as three seconds? Uh, as Melinda Gates says, I challenge you to name something that gets better on that kind of schedule. The reduction of annual childhood deaths worldwide, the quintuple, quintuple A number, in less, just slightly less than a quarter of a century, half. Mm -hmm. So stop clicking your feckin' fingers, Bono and Liam Neeson. You know, you're killing us out here. These annoying celebrities could click their fingers every five and a quarter seconds to show how many lives have been saved, says Manchester. Uh, Ian McEwan in a recent novel has a character say more or less the same thing. Humanity has never been so rich, so healthy, so long lived. When fewer die in wars and childbirth than ever before, when hundreds of millions have been raised from wretched subsistence, when in the West, even the middling poor recline in armchairs, charmed by music as they steer themselves down smooth highways at four times the speed of a galloping horse, even if you have a 1970 Datsun, he is still traveling in style. When smallpox, polio, cholera, measles, high infant mortality, illiteracy, public executions, we don't see those anymore, and routine state torture have been banished from so many countries? What are the commonplace miracles that would make a manual labor or the envy of Caesar Augustus? Pain-free dentistry, electric light, instant contact with people we love, with the best music the world has known, with the cuisine of a dozen cultures. I wasn't able to get an actual photo of what I want to show you. I, I saw it in the uh, museum in Cairo which unfortunately may, the artifact may not exist because that was that museum was looted uh, about six months after I saw it there. But what this represents is, looks like a colander, it's Pharaoh's shower, okay? The Pharaoh could have a shower because he had slaves, a couple of them to hold this over his head and then some more to pour buckets of water constantly through this and that gave the Pharaoh a shower with a lot of slave labor. Hey. You could do this every morning without slave labor. Hmm? One of the commonplace miracles, says, uh, says Ian McEwan, that would make Emmanuel labor the envy of Caesar Augustus or the Pharaoh. Water, flowing water, hot water, constantly. You could have as many showers a day as you can handle. Now, we're not as prosperous as the Pharaoh, but uh, we can have what only the Pharaoh had back then and hot water and even better, no slavery involved. We don't have to settle for Flint, Michigan. That's why we get outraged when it happens, you know? Cold water, hot water, fresh water flowing hmm? all the time. In short, this is Pinker's point. Modernization, the industrial revolution, the demographic transition, capitalism have increased human flourishing dramatically around the world, although there is still some way to go. Life expectancy up, global proportion in extreme poverty down, percent living under democracy up, working hours in the US and Europe down. The best of all possible worlds, no, not necessarily, but a hell of a lot better than the recent past and most of human history for that matter. In November 1755, feast day of all saints, right? An earthquake 8.5 to 9.0 magnitude, that is a very powerful earthquake, struck Lisbon, de devastated it. Anywhere between 10,000 and 100,000 died, hard to tell, but a lot of people. This had some influence on philosophy. Kant wrote about this. Um, the metaphor of firm foundations uh, rested on the philosophy of Descartes, got a hit from that. Uh, Voltaire wrote Candide uh, with his character, Dr. Pangloss, gloss it all over blithely repeating the optimistic theodicy of Leibniz. This is the best of all possible worlds. This is the best of all possible worlds. The earthquake in Lisbon uh, shattered that optimism. Um, 
in his work, Theodicy in 1710, uh, Leibniz proposed that the world in which we live is the best of all possible worlds. God could have created other worlds, but he created this one, and it's, it's as good as it gets. And this is what Voltaire satirizes in uh, Candide. All is the best for the best, for the best, all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds, we can say. This is Dr. Pangloss. Or Pollyanna, count your many blessings, it could all be worse. Having a bad day? Remember, it could be worse. You could be the elephant handler with a diarrhea elephant. Hmm? Perfect is the enemy of the good, as Voltaire said, but can the worst also be the, uh, the friend of the bad? Hmm? For those who may be having a bad day, it can always be worse. You're tunneling out of prison into a uh, outhouse pit. Hmm? Yeah, well, you don't notice it until it's gone. The old folks say it, it ain't no lie. You never miss your water till your well runs dry. Yeah, we don't tend to balance our credits and our debits. Uh, perhaps we could. Now, you don't become Pollyanna simply by noticing that life has become noticeably less poor, nasty, brutish, and short as Pinker does, and as Marx does, for that matter. Considerable poverty does remain. At the same time, the world as a whole is tremendously wealthy. Uh, in a way that it has not been for most of human history. Thesis one, on the whole, human society has, has amassed a level of wealth unprecedented in history. Thesis two, unprecedented wealth is distributed unevenly across the whole of human society. Both these theses are simultaneously true. So how has this human flourishing of which Aristotle and others speak been distributed? Well, material resources have increased, distribution has gotten increasingly unequal. Uh, the book to reckon with here is Capital by Thomas Piketty. Piketty and Saez, his friend, worked on some research for this uh, and come up with this, this amazing chart that I'm about to show you. Here it is. Hmm, what do you see here? Well, it tells us about the Income share of the top 0.1% of Americans over the course of about a century, 1913, 2012. And uh, we see that the top 1% uh, shared uh, upwards of 11% at one point early in the picture, down to nearly 2%, 3% or so in the middle, and back up to slightly higher level than the starting level by the end of the process. So there's a big spike on each end and a big trough in the middle. Um, the very, very, very richest had a tremendous amount of money at the beginning. Income inequality became much less throughout the course of the 20th century. At the end of the 20th century, into our century, it has risen back again to the levels that it once was. The Gilded Age, as they used to call it, uh, the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, followed by the New Deal, the Great Depression, World War II, uh, a leveling off uh, of, of income inequality until about the time of Mr. Thatcher, Mrs. Thatcher, sorry, uh, across the pond and Mr. Reagan here in our country. And now we're to the point where uh, intellectuals are talking about uh, being back in a new gilded age. Extreme income inequality uh, over this period of time. Income disparity between CEO and average worker is a good measure. It has not been constant, it's been increasing. Um, in 1968, the CEO of General Motors, that was the benchmark corporation at that point, 66 times the pay of the guy on his factory floor. 2010, CEO of Walmart, that's now the new benchmark corporation, 900 times the salary of the average Walmart, quote, associate, unquote, on the floor of the store. 66 times to 900 times, tremendous increase. The wealthiest 20% of the population own 85% of the wealth. The bottom 80% owns 15% of the wealth. That is to say, the guy at the top has, uh, has much more income um, than, than uh, basically the, the, four, the other four people at the bottom uh, are just distributed along the middle. Social stratification, categories, groups of people, uh, into a hierarchy based on wealth, power, and status. That's one thing. Stratification of wealth has gone to extremes. I showed you a diagram for the United States. This is a world diagram. It's not all that different. The rich, a champagne glass, basically. The richest quintile, the richest 20%, have the vast majority of wealth, 82.7% uh, 
uh, and then the other 18 or 17 percent, 17.3 is distributed among the other four quintiles, that is 80 percent of the population. Uh, so not only the U.S., but globally. The gang of eight, the eight richest people in the world, hold as much wealth as the bottom 50% of the world. Hmm? And we see here Bill Gates, Microsoft, uh, toward the top. I think Jeff Bezos is climbing uh, on him. Um, uh, Amancio Ortego uh, in Spain, Warren Buffett in America, Carlos Slim, Mexico, uh, Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, Larry Ellison, Bloomberg, all Americans. At the top, the top eight. And in the United States, the three wealthiest people in the US, that would be Bezos, Gates, and Buffett, now own more than half of the bottom half of the, more, more wealth than, half, than the bottom half of the country combined is what I mean to say. And Ellison, Bloomberg, and Zuckerberg are far behind. Tremendous increase at the top comes at the expense of the middle and the bottom, as I said before. Looking out my window, you know, there's a reason why those people are intense and jammed up in substandard housing. The minimum wage in this country is $7.25 an hour. This is what it translates into. Um, CEO guy making $20,000 an hour has to work 0 0.01 seconds for a gallon of milk. The uh, wage earner, minimum wage earner has to work half an hour for that same gallon of milk. Elizabeth Warren, if we started in 1960 and we said that as productivity goes up, then the minimum wage is gonna go up the same, the minimum wage today would be about $22 an hour. So my question, with the minimum wage of $7.25 per hour, what happened to the other $14? It certainly didn't go to the workers. Um, real median family income has flatlined. Productivity, as, as Warren says, has indeed gone up. What happened? The New York Times says if wages kept pace with profits, the minimum wage would be $17 instead of $7.25. Warren says $22. In either case, somebody's pocketing the difference. 57 to 67%. How long does it take to earn $8,840, says this particular piece of propaganda. Um, the average CEO, half a day. Uh, the uh, charwoman who cleans up his office at night, uh, one year. Now, quarrel about the precise numbers. This little piece of propaganda does exaggerate the numbers. The magnitude remains huge. Uh, it takes actually uh, a CEO a full day to earn what she earns in a year. So, but still, extremely disproportionate, even when you do the numbers correctly. And what is the effect on the average person of human flourishing as it's distributed in this country and around the world? This was forgotten for the longest time. It's been revived recently. In 1944, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, president of the U.S., um, proposed an economic bill of rights during his State of the Union address. A second bill of rights, and here's what he said. Every American has the right to a job, the right to an adequate wage and decent living, the right to a decent home. Not grace and favor, not just if we decide to give it to you, the right to a decent home, the right to medical care, the right to economic protection during sickness, accident, old age, unemployment the right to a good education. Can you think of another American president, Democrat or Republican, who said anything like that? He said it in 1944, perhaps it got lost in the, uh, in the, in the fog of war. Um, what if we had a second Bill of Rights? How's that working out for us so far? Hmm. Low wage workers are far more educated than they were in 1968, but they're being paid less. The gig economy will be 43% of the workforce by 2020. It's already there. Lots of McJobs. Now, a lot of people think that, well, you know, if you're poor, it's because you're lazy. I look at the newspaper and there are want ads. Why are these guys living on the street? Get a job. Get off your lazy ass, you bum. Because if you work really hard and are kind, amazing things will happen. I'll work for food. We have a category in our world, which is in Congress. And that category is the working poor, working poverty. That is people who have jobs, people who have multiple jobs, they're still not making enough at their job or jobs to put food on the table. They require aid, food stamps, you know, a a ABT, et cetera. It may seem an oxymoron, but unemployment isn't the only cause of poverty. You know. 
Um, and uh, again, this varies from country to country. The USA seems to have the highest ratio, but it's a problem, I think, wherever one finds it. Net economic worth is plummeting. 71% of Americans have less than $1,000 in savings. 49% have zero savings. Most Americans, if they had a $400 emergency, could not meet that $400 emergency. Hmm? Okay. I'm looking out my window. I think I mentioned this a little earlier. I live in a one family house that was built in 1890. So a lot of the houses in my neighborhood, the same thing. Mine's a little smaller, some of them are a little bigger. I can walk outside around the block, this house I'm looking at through my window here, and find eight to 10 water meters on this house. What does that mean? There are eight to 10 different families, or at least eight to 10 households, maybe multiple families per household, living in what was originally nominally a one family house. Now, you may say that's substandard housing, it is, but at least it's a roof over their heads. Why would the city not say, hey, these people are living in substandard housing, let's do something Because they are one paycheck away, that $400 that they don't have, one paycheck away from being out there in those tents a little farther on. Hmm? This is typical of downtown Los Angeles. This, the, my, my census tract has the highest density population in the entire United States. And it's because housing is not affordable and wages have not kept pace. You know, the ability uh, to pay the rent, even, and of course, now I'm, I'm speaking from the, the early year, early months of the, uh, the pandemic, a lot of people are employed, but even before that, even with high rates of employment, the wages they were bringing in wouldn't do it. Most people do not even have a savings account, don't have that $400 to meet a car repair or a medical bill, uh, to be able to pay the rent to make keep them going on the street. Shelter poverty um, refers to a situation in which people routinely spend more than 30% of their income on housing. 30% is the, what the government recommends. 50%, 60%, 70%. Um, it costs $1,400 to rent a room, basically, in Los Angeles. It costs $2,000, $2,400, I think, to rent an apartment. Um, the average wage in Los Angeles is $2,300. Figure it out. Um, yeah, basically, here we go. The US is the only major industrialized country that doesn't have universal health care. Even many developing countries do, you know? Suppose you want to find a country that doesn't force health care on you. Hmm, let's see. Costa Rica, Oman, Sri Lanka, no, they, they do it. Oh, Somalia, that's where you have to go. In the US, contrary to what FDI advocated in 1944, health care is still not a right. <laughs> Historically, it's been tied to jobs, and there's a history there. Again, during the Second World War, wages were frozen, so employers offered benefits, including health care, as another means of compensation to get around that uh, wage restriction. And that system stayed in place and led to the system we have now, where if you have health care, prior to Obamacare at least, it's tied to employment, uh, but you, your employer may, may not provide it, and if you're not employed, you have nothing. Uh, Obamacare shifts the burden to the workers. Originally, that was a Republican strategy until Obama adopted it, and then the Republicans turned around and damned it. But chronically underpaid and unemployed workers have difficulty affording drug prices. They are rising. You know, drug companies are predatory. People who have prescriptions sometimes have to cut them in half to get through. People cannot afford insulin for their children. Children are dying because they cannot get insulin. It's not that there's no insulin. There's the price structure and the payment structure uh, prevent that. Socialized medicine. I'd rather die than live in a country with socialized medicine, said no one ever. Well, actually, we do have socialized medicine in certain pockets. We have socialism for the rich. It's just that socialism for the average person, well, that's, uh, that's unthinkable. The military has long provided socialized medicine. I know this because I was born an army brat. And soldiers are not uh, very well paid. They have a very good retirement system, but while they're on active duty, they find it hard to make ends meet. So they, they benefit from subsidized commissaries, subsidized PXs, BXs, et cetera. But at least they have health care. We never had, when I was growing up as a boy, we never had to check the bank book before going to the doctor. We went to the doctor, that was it. Just healthcare was included. That's a nice way to live. 
why can't this be the case for every American? It is the case for every Frenchman, it is the case for every Briton, uh, every German, uh, et cetera, et cetera, but not at least in this country. So maybe it's the case that Dr. Pangloss and Chicken Little both have it right. The middle class is falling and this is at least the best world we've seen so far. Um, capitalism is, as Marx says, a system of exploitation, unequal exchange, but also an engine for economic prosperity unrivaled in history. Isn't Marx as angry as he is just because he sees how much humans are capable of doing? I warn you. I warn you. This was Neil Kinnock, British labor politician, uh, before the election of Mrs. Thatcher, who's very much like Mr. Reagan, uh, represents the, the neoliberal uh, budget cutting that has brought about a lot of the current outcome. If Margaret Thatcher, he says, wins on Thursday, I warn you not to be ordinary. I warn you not to be young. I warn you not to fall ill. I warn you not to get old. And on that Thursday, the 3rd of May, 1979, Mrs. Thatcher was indeed elected prime minister and therefore things did not go well for the young, for the ill, for the ordinary, for the old. And uh, this country has seen the same thing. So do not be ordinary. Do not be young. Do not fall ill. Do not get old. If you take care of that, then you're set. Hey, Aristotle might ask, are we flourishing yet? And a good education. Currently in the US, it's no more a right than our job and adequate wage, decent living, decent house. Uh, medical care, economic protection during sickness, accident, old age, or unemployment. It is thought to be a luxury rather than a right. So we're in the following situation. Bill Maher has a very good analogy here, uh, a pizza. Let's, let's see what he has to say. America's rich aren't giving you money, they're taking your money. Between the years 1980, between the years 1980 and 2005, 80% of all new income generated in this country went to the richest 1%. Let me put that in terms that even you fat ass teabaggers, sorry, can understand. Hey, Say a hundred Americans get together and order a hundred slice pizza. The pizza arrives, they open the box, and the first guy takes 80 slices. And if someone suggests, why don't you just take 79 slices, that's socialism! <laughs> yes. 100 slice pizza, 80 slices for Bill Gates. And then this guy comes along and says, watch out for those immigrants, they're gonna take away your slice. The growth of informal settlements, slums, and poor residential neighborhoods is a global phenomenon accompanying the growth of urban populations. 25% of the world's urban population lives in these informal settlements. Hmm? 213 million added since 1990. This is what we're talking about here. The shanty towns, the favelas that we see in the third world. Well, in the third world, they exist because of objective poverty. These are societies which are poor on the whole. But we see similar squalor in the United States. And this is not due to objective third world poverty levels. These houses in Detroit were once livable. These people in, in tents uh, in Los Angeles, presumably at some point or another, lived and maybe grew up in a house. Uh, it's not that there is no housing stock. It's not that there is no wealth. We live in a very wealthy society. You know, even with all the jobs being exported overseas, still tremendous amount of resources. This is not a third world country, even if we have third world housing conditions in some pockets. Okay, snowflake alert, whining about all these first world problems when there are third world problems. Yeah, but again, Voltaire's question is to the point. Can the worst also be the friend of the bad? I wanted to take a shower and then I forgot to bring a towel. Okay, snowflake. Uh, but we do have showers available. Uh, we don't have to settle for Flint, Michigan. And yet we do because this sort of thing is now a first world problem. So once again, um, our Dr. Pangloss and Chicken Little both right. We need to have some perspective. We need to have some balance. Uh, the best of all possible worlds, 
perhaps not. Much, much, much better than the recent past? Yes. Uh, the middle class is falling? Yes. Many uh, odd things may simultaneously be true. Severe impoverishment in the middle and the bottom of the U.S. is not due, though, to scarcity or any natural causes. The potential for human flourishing has, is greater than it has ever been. It's just that the abundance we're able to produce is not being distributed very well. I mentioned Marx earlier. There's a common way of reading Marx, Louis um, Althusser, for example, uh, which stresses a discontinuity between Marx and his predecessors, particularly the philosophers of German idealism. And this is something, again, I want to address toward the end of this course. I want to show there's a, indeed quite a continuity. But Marx channels Kant at some point. He talks about the categoric imperative to overthrow all relations in which man is a debased, enslaved, abandoned, despicable essence. Martin Luther King. Call it democracy or call it democratic socialism, but there must be a better distribution of wealth within this country for all God's children. Am I the only one that suspects that Aristotle would agree with Marx and with King? And that ends uh, the talk on ethics. So I will see you for the next talk on elaborated epistemology. Thank you and good day.